yesterday uh, session on e-mobility uh, policies and plans. Here's a quick recap. Um, for like, uh, there was a long discussion and for the immediate actions on EVs uh, in Nepal based on the uh, EVs based on the needs and public demand, uh, Bhushan highlights that Nepal needs to prioritize on e-bus and charging, e-two-wheelers, um, as well as increase uh, public procurement of EVs. Um, the Joint Secretary of Ministry of Physical Infrastructure and Transport gave an overview of EV policies in Nepal. A case of Kochi in India shows how national, state and local government are promoting EVs with a joint effort and with the coordinated actions. Uh, the development of NAMP and integration of EVs was also discussed with the case example in the Philippines. Lastly, in the, in the panel discussion presented by national, provincial and local government as well as private sector highlighted that the policy implementation is an issue in Nepal and there is a need of national technical standards for EVs. Um, a coordinated effort of various forms of government is a key step ahead uh, to promote EVs in Nepal. Uh, just a little warm up uh, to begin with and uh, to understand who are in the room and uh, which organization you represent. That's great. Uh, we have a huge uh, participations from academia as well as uh, the private sector and the NGOs. Um, as I said earlier, so this session would be uh, a technical one, so that it would be uh, uh, good or, or helpful for the participants. I will begin our today's session. Uh, we will focus today on EV technology, operation maintenance and retrofitting. I will moderate the session. I'm a researcher at Bupatal Institute, work under Research Unit Mobility and International Cooperation. I also coordinate Asian Cities and Solutions Plus, uh, including Kathmandu. So agenda for today, today we have six presentations focusing, uh, four of them will focus on EV technologies, operation and maintenance, standard development presented by uh, Matt from Volvo, Umesh uh, from Shriko Visionary, uh, Vittorio from CRO and Doc Mani from De La Salle University. After that, we will uh, deep dive into vehicle retrofitting uh, uh, presented by Karan from P PCL and Abhishek from Abhiyantri Karmashala. I will again uh, just to know uh, uh, your knowledge on the operation and maintenance of uh, EVs. Uh, I'll just ask to open a second slide. What do you think the operation and maintenance of EV is it? Yeah, less complicated and requires less maintenance and than uh, than IC vehicles, or it's very complicated than IC vehicles. We have your answer, and now we, we will see what the expert has to say on this aspect. Uh, so without further delay, uh, let's start with the first presentation by Matt uh, Rosenquist, uh, Quist from Volvo. He works with a public, uh, public partnership at the Project uh, product, uh, Strategy Office in Gothenburg, Sweden, a, a public project for sustainable transport solutions for commercial vehicles. Uh, he's also a member of uh, the Coordination Committee at European Council of Automotive R&D Automotive and leader of expert group uh, group vehicle uh, commercial vehicles so uh, yeah matt's floor is yours thanks Thank thanks you. i'll give you a little update on the uh, the battery electric bus in the public transport operation but since i'm not really that detailed into the technology i, I need to start uh, more from a uh, let let look on the bus in its context so to say we it's very important when we work with electric buses and uh, volvo has been a front runner in this uh, we have been doing this for i would say 10 15 20 years uh, working in the area it, it has very it's very clear that the bus technology maybe it it's not the biggest question actually so um so I think that's my my presentation today with kind of look into this from from more a system a type of perspective to see where does what technology features are maybe more of importance so I, I mean looking at this kind of picture where you you start with the integration in the transport system you really need to understand 
what is the electric truck and what can it actually achieve? Uh, because it, uh, even if the bus might be easier to, to operate, uh, there are another uh, type of new sector that needs to be understood. And of course, this is uh, the charging system. Uh, I think the, the energy provider system, how to provide energy for a fleet of buses. That's a new new thing actually for the bus operators when we are, uh, we have of course the battery itself. It's a new, quite expensive and heavy and uh, also in have rapid development. So the battery needs to be looked into. Maybe the chassis can be uh, similar to what your what is already in a, a standard bus of today. But, but it's still, uh, there are new things coming in here when it comes to the electrification topics, how to really adjust the chassis for that. And that depends on, the, of course, the, the, uh, the situation where this needs to be done. Um, the control connectivity, it's also something that needs to be addressed. The driver uh, needs to be aware of the sharding station of the bus the sharding situation of the bus and when to charge and how to run. Uh, th there are maybe new uh, things regarding uh, safety requirements that needs to be taken into cons consideration. And I will also touch upon the kind of the electric propulsion system, the engine um, more and have some kind of a, at least a highlight about how to compare this with the, the internal combustion engine, the ICE. So look into the more the, the integration in the transport system. I think we start always discussing this from, from kind of the top. What are the kind of the, what are the driving forces for electrification? Why are you doing this? Um, there are a lot of good things to go for elect electrification of the public transport system, but, but it's important to understand why, what are the driving forces? Are you actually solving the right topics? So of course, emissions is the local emissions, particles, NOx, but we as increasingly see that the noise, uh, noise uh, emissions is even more important and uh, also the less vibrations from a truck the drivers are very happy with with a, with an electric bus because it's less vibrating uh, so it's a lot of benefit of course if you look into this the U united nations the global goals for health well-being and and also linking this to the sustainable cities and transport systems but here you also need to understand where does the electric energy come from uh, if you produce electric energy from coal, uh, then you might end up in an even worse situation when it comes to emissions and uh, local. But of course, there are a lot of room here for innovation. This is a quite new sector. It's a, it's a new type of product. The uh, diesel engine has been around for, for a very long time, but now we are we're seeing a, a dramatic development in the area of electrification and in electrification of the public transport system. And, and of course, from Volvo, we are also very engaged in the trucking uh, domain. You see electric truck, even heavier electric trucks. The climate issue, of course, uh, it's, everyone is talking about that. And, and also the safety topic. We always want to discuss safety. We need to consider this uh it, it that that also needs to be the of taking into consideration from a driving force to improve safety i think it's also important to work to really align with the city strategies when when you look into the uh, sorry i missed the other uh, section when it policy but but they they really why why are Kathmandu looking into this um but of course to align with reducing local po pollutants noise CO2 uh, uh, also increase the, the use actually of, uh, of the public transport system to make them more attractive uh, and to be more user friendly. And also this level with lower noise, lower uh, emissions, and you can actually 
as we, I mean, my behind me, you can see the picture. We are testing indoor bus stops. Uh, we can actually run the bus in a completely new way to integrate the system and, and really find new way of doing this. But it's important to work together here with, uh, and of course, the, the, you, you need to shift here now from the old bus fleet and uh, towards a uh, clean technology, kind of how to integrate the new technology with the old technology uh, and really to work on this, what the Europeans call modal shift, shift um, to public transport. So that there is many good things in order to drive for this. And I think we see that. And then of course, um, to operate an electric bus or public transport system, it, it's uh, it's slightly it's a new world, uh, and uh, of course you you need to understand what are the new roles that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, what are the operational targets really for? Uh, so there are many, of course, new players coming in, but you also have the existing players. But you also kind of you need to look into the. Um, one one new thing is this power utility, where uh, you need to provide the electric infrastructure, uh, and you should have a stable power supply when it comes to these these different uh, when to sh really charge and do. Otherwise, it, it's not as flexible as a diesel solution where you can fill up in the morning and and it's. Uh, but you, you, it needs to be taken into consideration. And of course, the operator uh, really how to, how to run this, how to make it happen, uh, really the operational targets, uh, reliability, cost. And even if the, the product might be less complicated, the, the issue is also it, it's less known. And in electric bus, it's a new type of technology. Um, you also have uh, uh, potentially lower uh, maintenance and operational cost, but the consequence is higher cost when it comes to the battery. Um, and, and you need the investment in the battery. The battery needs to be maintained in a good way. You also have high power, uh, high voltage in the vehicle that could provide a, a safety issue when it comes to maintaining these vehicles, new type of regulatory, um, you, you need to cons consider this as well. So th this needs to be taken into the whole picture uh, of, of the system perspective and uh, with the role and operational targets. And then we, we also, when I'm working on this, you also see that there are the business model here gets quite complicated. Who owns, it's not only the bus, but you also need to invest in the sharding system. Uh, you also really to build a new type of infrastructure equipment for, for this. Who owns this? What are the opportunities to get, how to fund this and, uh, <clears throat> and really pay for what? Are you buying a bus or will you actually invest in 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 this uh, so i think it's it's very important to clear out who will how is the funding mechanism how will that work really what are the, uh, the, the there are many new actors coming in and there are quite high costs for some of these this investment that needs to be done it's definitely not only the bus so uh, so it's there could be benefit of course for a lower fuel cost or energy cost overall but at the same time this will be uh, eaten up or uh, you need to invest more in the charging equipment on the battery on the bus uh, and also the, the there are things about of course there are a lot of subsidy program in order to promote electrification uh, that could also have a dimensioning effect on what type of technology you will be using, depending on how the subsidies are directed. Uh, that will also make an impact on the technology, selection of technology. 
Uh, of course, the vehicle age structure, how long will you foresee? What are, is the operational targets for how many years will these vehicles be op in operation in order to be profitable? And so on and so forth. And so they, of course, they, it's boiled down to the specifications. What, what will you actually work on? So the specifications is much about the requirements and need. What you, you're having some planning, the distance between charging um, locations, where, how, how are you operating? What line operation? This will be very much dimensioning the the sizing of what type of equipment you need to fit on the bus. You don't want to have too much batteries. Uh, at the same time, you need to have, where can you locate the charging uh, stations? Can you charge online or can you do uh, like, um, of course, what are the operational uh, requirements for the route? Can you do depot charging? You charge overnight. And then you do some kind of top off charging op during an operation uh, when, when you run this. Uh, you have other things to consider is also the climate. Uh, I mean, Nepal can also be, of course, it, you have a hot, but you can also have a cold climate. So it's um, the heating, the air conditioning, um, the energy usage. Sometimes we see that uh, the uh, the air conditioning consume maybe more energy than actually propel, pro, push, no, driving the, 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 the bus. And um, then, of course, the operational targets, what are the passenger, the load situation, how much passenger will you run, uh, the speed of this, the energy usage. Uh, and it's very much about the battery configuration, how much battery will you have on board? or how little can you have on board, because batteries are also heavy, uh, which that could also have an impact on the chassis dimensioning. If you load many tons of batteries, you actually transport more batteries than people and passenger. Is that really what you want to do? Uh, and then of course, it's linked to where to, how much charging power, uh, what are the charging speed required? Um, this also put a, put a dimensioning from the electricity grid, how much power can you really provide and how much do you actually need uh, in order to run the, the bus operation. So I think this is very important to, to, to really understand before really building a bus. Uh, I can mention, and you are, many of you are aware of this, we in Gothenburg, we have been doing this in a kind of a collaboration environment uh, since now almost 10 years. We have been working with the city authorities, with the, with the energy providers, uh, with the energy um, and also charging equipment. So I think the, it's very important to set up this kind of structure around, really discuss and to really work on the different solutions, involve the different actors all, all the way try to grow this. For us, it has taken many years to understand are we actually working on the right topics and how to work on this uh, before we actually could launch the first electric bus in operation. Uh, so I think we have a lot of experience and I think uh, from the electricity, electricity package, there are a lot of uh, that good learnings that can be brought out from this. So then, then taking a little more technical step then towards the bus, the technology features of electric bus to look into the charging solutions, the battery system and the propulsion system, uh, more select three of those. So if you start looking at the bus, um, and then, then the battery. We um, in in Europe, we we are working on low floor buses, and I'm sure you are not working on. You probably have a high floor, low entry type of bus that you will will consider for Nepal, uh, because that but that is more suitable for, uh, for what type of road condition you have. A low floor could be good when you have a 
very uh, kind of smooth uh, road surface. Uh, so this is kind of what we are working on. So our expertise is definitely in the European, uh, where in this case, we actually have the mounting of the battery in the roof. Yeah, I provided a picture here uh, where you, you actually have, you can store many different battery packs and you, you place them on the roof because that provides a, a better planning in, and you can have really build low floor buses. Uh, there is a video here if you want to see how 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 really uh, buses in, has been produced or built in our factory in Poland. Uh, if you're more looking into that, um, and of course one, one other things uh, I mean temperature controlling of batteries. Batteries need to be not too hot. Really, we, it's very important to keep them cool or according to the temperature controlling. So the temperature control of batteries is very important in order to keep them uh, in shape. Otherwise you wear out the battery and you lose and, and then it will cost more than you really uh, have expected. So temperature controlling is important. Uh, then of course the battery packs. Uh, in, in our operation we, we have a I provided this example, one pack like this is 94 kilowatt hours. It should be an hour here. Um, and then you can fit a, a number of uh, different type packs, uh, of course, uh, depending on what you need. Uh, and then you can fit up to five battery packs up to 470 kilowatt hour. That's a lot really. Uh, but but in, then you also, um, you also need to look into the um, kind of the mass here. What well, I mean, one of these pack costs is it's a lot of weight, like almost 600 kilograms for one pack, and that that will put quite the stress on the on the chassis and the mounting where to where to put this. Uh, of course, the C rating, how much that that's the kind of how much you can charge uh, depending on the on the size of the battery. This is also, uh, I mean, a, a C rate of, of one, it means that you can charge a 94 kilowatt hour battery with 94 kilowatt. Um, in, at the same time, you have the voltage of 600 volt, and that's quite high actually. So you need to be careful. This is, um, this is lethal, which means that you need to comply with the regulatory framework of, of this. Um, and I think the, we, we need also to, to understand that the bus is part of a system. So it, the uh, charging system needs also to be taken into consideration. Um, there are kind of two main way of, of charging a bus, the CCS2 or the kind of the, the normal, uh, it's actually in AC, AC but, but that's, uh, the, this is the, when you do the overnight charging or you, or you can, um, or charging at the depot, you, you dock it in and you have, in, the, in our case, up to 150 kilowatt, maybe you don't need that much for a depot uh, charging overnight, but this needs to be fitted in. So a uh, charging, solution needs to be, be in place. Uh, and, and also the, the in onboard charging equipment needs to be there in order to manage the charging, uh, in order to manage the charging to, to really make sure you don't, you really use the batteries in, in a, a good way as possible. A lot of experience that, that this is in one area where we have learned a lot really, but, but the, the whole sector is need to learn this. So collaboration with the charging equipment uh, needs to be, be in place. When it comes to the, what we call then the opportunity charging, op charge standard, this is when you can charge uh, en route or at the end uh, when stops or, or, or starting or end stop, or maybe also in the middle of a route, depending on what type of route selection you have. Maybe you have high 
hills or uh, you need to you can have time uh, and that there is an actually an uh, an industry standard for this and this all there are a lot of um yeah i mean you, you can do this in different ways there are different kind of pantograph solutions in order to to solve this and uh, i would also highlight that there are a lot of good standards already available you can click on the link uh, in the presentation i will actually see on this opcharge.org and it it, it tells more about own, not only the the the, um, the the sharding itself it's quite quite good uh, a reference really to also depend when it we discuss about electric safety you have the insulation voltage so what what do you need to consider um, electromagnetic compatibility uh, you don't want uh, so there the, so there are a lot of electrical considerations communication things how to really because the, the part, charging standard also include the communication between the bus and the charging stations so really so there are this is a new technology that needs to be also taken into consideration uh, and in, in this case also is a wi-fi connection between the bus and the charging equipment so i think there are a lot of material available uh, it, it's important to bring into when really working on on the bus system finally when it comes to technology um, I mean, we have taken, uh, this has been a journey where we need to, the, the diesel engine, of course you have the diesel tank or the, ex, but also the uh, YATS or the exhaust after treatment systems with the new emission regulation coming, uh, this has been more and more advanced. So I think a, a European <clears throat> uh, bus with diesel engine and you can also drive that on hvo or some biofuel um, it getting quite complex so it, it's a complex machine um, but it's also very it's a very good machine very efficient which means that our step we have been taken towards the hybridization so we have been working with hybrid buses where you have the electric uh, engine working together with the uh, with the ICE and of course you need the battery but you also need the engine the after treatment system because you have emissions so now we see more a further step towards the full electric battery electric um, buses but and, and then the development then for, of course for the electric motor um, so it, this is, of course, we have, this is a development that goes quite quickly. The electric motor, in this case, there's a single motor, but we also run double, could be double configuration in order to optimize this, the speed, the torque, um, and also drivability, you have maintainability, the robustness and all this there is also a gearbox in this to kind of connect this to the normal drivetrain and then you need to consider the battery packs the battery management system uh, gets quite complicated because there's a lot of high power electronics that needs to to play here together to really drive um, drive the el electric motor uh, in an optimal way you and also need you have the onboard charger we you can consider energy re regeneration in order to to optimize the usage of energy uh, over uh, so there are many i would say the step comparing the ICE uh, to this and, and there are a lot of new technology coming into play and elect electric and electronics and software gets even more important here. So there are new, new technology, new knowledge that needs to be for, for maintaining the, these vehicles. You need to have more electronic, electric and 
software skills uh, depend. And, and when it comes to an IC, IC and diesel engine, it's more a mechanical uh, piece where you can see the diesel pump or this, the, uh, all these more mechanical uh, engineering. So I think the step here is towards here, it's a lot of new technology that needs to be taken into consideration. So summing up my presentation today, um, of course, you need to you know, be aware of the driving forces. What are you trying to achieve with the electrification of the public transport system? What are really the needs? Um, what are the operational targets? How will this what are how will this bus be used that will put the requirements how much battery you need on board what type of charging uh, where to locate the charging and how to build this up the system and this is also closely linked to the business models who what are the costs for this uh, if you have a very expensive or low cost bus you might have a very expensive charging equipment and uh, and they, maybe the op business model doesn't add, add, add up in a, in a positive way. So the, when you understand this, it's, then you can really break down the requirements on the whole system, the bus charging system, the energy system, the maintenance and that. And I, and I also stress this with collaboration. It's so important to work with the right partners around the table to do this together, try to solve the the technology topics, but you, then you need to understand that you are solving the right topics. Um, the big piece here is the energy, energy storage, the batteries. That's one of the most expensive pieces in the puzzle. Uh, and you don't want to replace them too often. Okay, and then uh, we have then the charging, the energy system linking to the electric, grid, um, which is of course very important. You need to have access to this grid, uh, otherwise the system will not fail. And then there, of course the electric propulsion system will, with all the technology and new te technology that you consider here, the high power electronics, software, um, and also the, the safety issues when it comes to uh, having high power or high voltage system on board uh, that can be quite challenging. Uh, so I think uh, I will stop my presentation here and um, I'm open for your questions. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. Uh, thank you for a quite detailed overview on what are the key features of e-buses and what needs to be taken while operating them. Uh, I will ask uh, participants or audience to post the question. I have a, here a first question uh, from Gaurav. Uh, in the rooftop charging uh, CCS2, uh, can you tell how charging systems are kept safe from weather conditions such as rain? Is that an issue? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. I think this is, of course, um, I mean, with, with a good uh, with a good design of the of the uh, of the packing, you have the battery pack. They are stored, in, of course, in uh, you you mount often you mount this the battery cells into a battery pack and, and or a modulum pack, and these are really stored on. In our case, the roof, uh, um, and then of course, I think it's more to keep things tight and, and safe. Um, and the rooftop might be quite advanced, but we this has been one of the top things when we are maintaining uh, these buses. We have a specific maintenance uh, kind of facility in order to maintain the, the rooftop mounted batteries. Um, and of course, you need to keep, uh, keep the ceiling tight, really. So it's impos impossible really to do this. But maybe if it can be easier to, to consider a kind of a low mounting on batteries. Uh, if you have a high floor bus, then you can mount this uh, kind of in, in a better way. I think that might be another 
like, like we see in the bus, uh, the truckies, trucks we have, then we mount the batteries on the side of the chassis and the beams. Um, yeah. Hopefully yeah, that. Thanks. How difficult are the component replacement, for example, battery or other engines in terms of availability of components and the associated cost? Now, uh, the point what, what you mean with the replaceability. Um, we, we see that when running these buses, you wear out the batteries. So one of the things we have learned is that you can actually have a second life of batteries. So what we do today, that's a new type of operation. We move used batteries, maybe you lose capacity. Uh, so much that it, it makes no sense to have them on bus, then the, you can use them for a second life. Uh, and and uh, in this case, together with kind of as a backup battery for in a housing facility. But you also have some kind of re, uh, remanufacturing or refurbish of, of the battery, depending also how you, um, yeah, so that's, I mean, it's, we, we, it's a lot of things we, we learn, we learn as we go. Now, now it's in Europe, it is getting more and known technology. So we, there are more and more in full operation, but it has been a journey, I would say, to, to learn this. Generally, the efficiency of performance of traction motors are optimized based on European or American urban and high driving cycles, mm -hmm. but the traffic or driving cycle is completely different. Uh, do you think it's better to optimize customized motor based on our driving cycle for optimum performance. Uh, what is your thoughts on that? Again, back to the requirements, really. Maybe you, you should consider, uh, maybe not the op performance might be good enough, but maybe it's more for maintainability. It should be easy to maintain, maybe better uh, or an, uh, a technology that is for a European or American context, maybe you need higher speed, but maybe in a Nepal situation, you might have systems that are more robust that will withstand and last for, maybe you have over dimension in order to, to make them more, uh, you, more the, uh, for robustness and maintainability. Also, maybe the, the road surface are more rough. You, you need to protect the, the technology to really withstand, uh, I mean, I've been to Nepal, so I mean, there are a lot of challenges here. So it's, uh, uh, I think, very much boiled down to what type of requirements you have uh, and uh, to do, do the right selection of motor. Uh, and also there are many different technology when it comes to motor design. Um, I mean, the different technology to select and, and some are more advanced when it then you require more power electronics in order to control and manage uh, or, or maybe have an, a simpler motor or more robust so there are many options here that's that's the uh, that's that's the good thing i mean as an engineer it's a lot of opportunities but but if you try to do this uh, and to operate the bus then also a lot of challenges actually if the question is referred to electric machine of, uh, for instance, induction type, so AC induction that have a flux controlled by the current you put in the machine, you can undoubtedly, simply by the control, modify the performance and efficiency area. For instance, increasing efficiency, penalizing partly extreme performance. So in some cases, uh, without uh, changing the hardware, that obviously is a cost, it's a PDA roadblock, uh, there are opportunities to make the electric system better performing according to the specific needs of the place where you use it. Good. Uh, thanks a lot, Mats. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I heard you, are, you, are, you have to leave uh, after this presentation. So thank you for, for your input and, and your uh, kind contribution on this training. Yeah. Yeah, thank you thank and you. thanks for inviting me here so it's thank you thank you now we uh, we move into uh the experience in operation and maintenance of evs in nepal presented by umesh shrestha 
So Umes is a CEO of uh, Sri Eco Visionary. He is also chairman of Clean Locomotive Inter uh, Entrepreneurs Association in Nepal, and also a former president of Ivan. He has over two decades of experience working uh, in the EV sector in Nepal, focusing on import sales, repair maintenance of EVs and battery services. Uh, he's also engaged in solutions plus demonstration projects on the modular electric three-wheeler. Uh, so Umesh, uh, the floor is yours. My name is Umesh Rasprasta. Uh, I've been in this field from last uh, 22, 23 years and working in a field of electric vehicle in Nepal and uh, operating uh, charging stations and maintenance and also uh, having experience on uh, assembling and manufacturing the vehicle as well. Uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, if we have to come up uh, with the maintenance uh, of the electric vehicle, uh, we have to say that the, because of the very less parts and uh, like a, uh, in a conventional vehicle, fossil fuel vehicle, we have uh, lots of parts like the engines, the gearbox and everything. Uh, but uh, here in our electric vehicle, uh, as per our experience, and uh, there is a very fewer moving part. And uh, uh, basically it is uh, more easier for maintenance. Uh, but uh, we have to, again, do some analysis on the uh, another sector, the, which uh, right now there are more number of uh, modern electric vehicles are coming, where uh, uh, in which there is a lo lot of uh, integration that has to be made, some software, softwares, and uh, battery management systems, uh, charging facilities. These all things are there, and uh, there are some uh, bottlenecks. Uh, in a maintenance uh, um, in an electric vehicle in Nepal uh, um, right now, uh, which is uh, basically uh, one of the very important facets where we have to concentrate uh, right now in perspective of Nepal. So uh, in, in case of a Nepal, uh, there are certain vehicles already plying uh, here, like the two wheeler, uh, scooters and uh, three-wheeler suffer tempos from long ago. It, it has been flying and there are, there are e-rickshaws, electric cars, and uh, now uh, electric buses as well. So uh, in case of uh, operation and maintenance, if we see that uh, uh, we, our vehicle, uh, basically, Two-wheeler, it has been almost uh, 10 years of experience in uh, the Nepal market. If we take a Sofa Tempo three-wheelers, it is already uh, 25 years, and it has given a very good uh, you know, uh, uh, return back. We, we, this, this, this is one of the milestone in the Nepal, where we can say that uh, the electric vehicle is a very much durable, uh, and it is one of the very sustainable mode of a transport system. And uh, thirdly, there is a, from six, seven years, we have a, a electric three-wheeler e-rickshaws as well. And uh, uh, recently from uh, seven, eight years, nine years, uh, we can see there are lots of a four-wheeler also. Initially, there was only a Reva, but from last two years, uh, Three years, we can see lots of uh, uh, big brands like uh, Hyundai and uh, um, Kia, and other uh, companies like uh, uh, MZ has also been introduced. And in case of electric buses, it has been just uh, introduced, and uh, almost uh, it is only uh, 2.5 years that. We, uh, uh, that, is, that, that has been operating right now. So uh, the experience of uh, uh, operation and maintenance of an electric vehicle uh, is like this in Nepal. Uh, so uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, Safa Tempo, we have been operating these in more than 25 years. And uh, 
the in case of uh, uh, battery management systems and uh, battery technology all, in all these years lots of things has been changed and even right now the suffer tempos also with the newer technology and the newer battery systems uh, many things has been changed and uh, uh, like uh, initially we used to use a uh, brass motors and uh, a lead acid batteries now uh, integrated system of uh, ac drive systems and uh, 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 your um, lithium lithium based battery has been has been started using in this suffer tempos and this has uh, from last 25 years uh, it is uh, supported as a public transport where uh, the electric vehicle this type of electric vehicle are uh, ran in the harsh condition uh, ran, uh, almost 120 kilometers every day and this type of uh, electric vehicle also has created a uh, lots of a uh, job opportunity like in a charging station uh, to the mechanics uh, to the charging station operators and even a uh, drivers uh, and even uh, the one more important thing uh, is uh, in nepal in suffer tempo we have a uh, lots of uh, ladies driver female driver who are driving as a driver owner themselves and they have, you know, uh, lots of jo job opportunity has been, you know, created. And uh, as a, this is a clean and zero emission transportation, beside um, 20, 20, year, uh, 20 years uh, rule, the government has also provided these vehicle uh, 30 years. And beside this, I think uh, uh, there are lots of uh, workshops and, uh, um, System, uh, there's lots of systems for a uh, three-wheeler electric rickshaw and uh, uh, two-wheeler uh, scooters already, but still there is uh, some challenges uh, still there. Like if we have to go into more public vehicle, bigger buses and uh, uh, a bigger type of uh, infrastructure in a public transport system also, and in even in uh, uh, private uh, electric vehicle also, there is some hindrance in the policy uh, where you know even uh, uh, right now there are a charging station uh, for a charging station facility. Uh, um, government has indicated uh, you know 500 places there will be a charging station and even uh, NEA has already Nepal Electricity Authority has told there is a, uh, they have already endorsed for a 50 charging station, but still uh, on back in the mind, there is always uh, some uh, uh, insecurity for the oper uh, operator of an electric vehicle that if they go to, uh, from one city to another city, will they get uh, uh, technical support or not? Uh, uh, there could be, uh, if some wear and tear happen, if some accident happens, then they, can they get uh, spare parts on time or mechanics on time or uh, the technical support in time? So uh, in this aspect, uh, still, there are some developments that has to be made, like uh, there should be some uh, EV zones and other places where uh, there is a basic requirement uh, for you know making a people uh, into a comfort zone uh, to operating EV. Basically, in a, uh, if we see uh, if we compare with the conventional vehicle, yes, of course, as we said earlier, uh, um, there is only a battery motor and controllers and electric uh, propulsion system uh, there. Uh, in a mechanical term, yes, of course, uh, there is a very uh, few parts uh, which are used uh, uh, for uh, driving the vehicle. Uh, but still, uh, we have a, another uh, aspect, as I said, there is a charging facility is required, the charging maintenance, and then charging, uh, charging stations and infrastructure development. And uh, on beside that, uh, there is a requirement of a 
service station in all the areas uh, of uh, you know uh, urban cities and uh, in the middle of the you know transition routes mm. uh, of different cities so uh, we can see that uh, in a electric systems also uh, we don't have uh, like for the charging facilities also uh, in uh, we know that in the many of the places still the distribution line system uh, is uh, still uh, not good and uh, if we have to uh, get the high voltage electrical system for a charging and uh, these things there is a uh, some uh, uh, still the infrastructures has uh, has to be developed and uh, in case of a battery pack uh, also basically in case of a battery pack we can see that uh, all the batteries that uh, that has been produced by uh, the big companies uh, it is already uh, tested in uh, extreme conditions uh, like uh, extreme uh, temperature extreme vibration short circuit to fire humidity so uh, in case of a battery there is a we can say that um, for a lithium battery now the this uh, developed battery we have a uh, lots of uh, safety measures already there and uh, uh, in case of uh, batteries also we need to have some uh, additional uh, brainstorming where uh, we can in nepal also we can uh, assemble the batteries and manufacture the batteries this type of uh, and uh, after self service for uh, these batteries uh, even uh, bms fa facilities software programming facilities this this uh, things has to be you know done and uh, like uh, uh, because of the battery the evs uh, basically does have a, uh, a very good center of gravity and this is more uh, stable uh, vehicle so in case of ev i think uh, the less uh, accident uh, are faced so right now uh, the emergency response for the electric uh, drive vehicles uh, is not significantly developed uh, different from that of a conventional vehicle actually uh, but still uh, as i said earlier there is a requirement of a ev zone concept in different part of uh, nepal uh, which is not yet developed and uh, uh, right now as we said that there is a uh, uh, lots of a new type of a vehicles uh, already in uh, nepal uh, which is uh, with a very new softwares and uh, there are very less people uh, there is very technicians who does know about these programming systems and we even i think don't have a scanning devices and some uh, diagnosis system uh, in this vehicle so these things has to be introduced in nepal uh, most of the four wheeler uh, vehicle means uh, passenger cars and new buses are just introduced so uh, they have not performed it and uh, we need to see uh, what type of a prob problem will be uh, in the future and uh, for that also i think uh, we need to have a technical manpower uh, there should be some engineering teams like from a, a educational institute like tu ku and other in, uh, institutions there should be uh right now uh, there are, with the ku and tu there are there are come up in, uh, come uh, coming up with uh, new batches of engineers uh for automobile uh, segment and uh, i think they should now the academicians also should be concentrated in uh, providing a very good knowledge on electric vehicle sector because it is a emerging uh, area Uh, in nepal and in the world so uh, as we are uh, one of the very 
important aspect for uh, maintenance is a uh, human resource so i think uh, now engineering uh, institutes uh, the automobile engineers and even uh, simple technicians and mechanics has to be trained uh, to maintain the electric vehicle so this is all that uh, some brief uh, about the electric vehicle maintenance system in nepal uh, thank you very much thank you thanks a lot umesh thanks for sharing the situation of uh, ev operation and maintenance in nepal of course uh, ev technology existed long time back uh, there but there is a difficulty with catching up with new technologies and lack of local capacity um i also see that there is also a challenge on the local industry working on ev sector due to the lack of proper guidance and standards for evs at the national and local level uh this is where we are touching up uh, in our next presentation and uh, i will i will take up the questions for umesh afterwards so please uh, put your questions in the chat box uh, so with this i would like to invite our next uh, speaker uh, just let me share my screen yeah yeah uh, so uh, so our, so next the next speaker is vittorio ravello <laughs> Uh, he's from CRU and will present on technical standards uh, required for operating, testing, and maintaining EVs. So, Vitor is a global innovation uh, electrification program manager at Fiat uh, Research Center or CRU. He has almost three decades of experience and is an expert in the areas of EVs, EV standardization, and related e power system. Uh, Vittorio, uh, floor is yours. Thank you to everybody. Uh, I will give you a, an overview of the standards, particularly standards in the field of electric vehicle, operation, maintenance uh, uh, part, uh, and uh, testing too. Uh, I apologize due to the fact that the presentation by itself is not so much sexy, maybe a little boring, there are a lot of lists of standards, but I hope uh, uh, more than two presenters of them that is not possible in the time we have uh, can be useful for you to have as a reference uh, for a very fine select the one that you need. Uh, as very first, a simple initial slide just to clarify what is at the end the standard and what is, uh, for instance, an homologation process. The standard is uh, at the end a norm uh, or a requirement that is in general applicable to a repeatable technical task. Uh, physically is a document, is a formal document uh, that has the scope to establish uh, uniform engineering or technical criteria of time specification, method, process, and practice. Uh, standards are the basis for another very relevant part of the game that is the homologation. Homologation is not standard, homologation is done with regulation. Uh, the regulation and the scope of granting the approval through and by an official authority to something, for instance, the fact that we can put a vehicle on the road and use it. And uh, in particular, in the automotive field, uh, this homologation uh, uh, system cover two important areas. One is the safety, that also in the electric vehicle is relevant, also because the electric vehicle has some specific safety element related to the batteries and the voltages. And the second is the environmental impact that from this extent, in the case of electric vehicle is largely better and simpler than a traditional car. To perform these uh, uh, type approval processes uh, through the regulation, in the regulation are typically applied conform and the conformance is applied through technical standards. So technical standards should act in general as elementary technical brick to be used in the regulation to reach the approval of uh, the vehicle in this case. In particular, uh, looking at the European scenario, European scenario is based on uh, this organization, UNICI, that is the United Nations Economic Commission of Europe, that has built up, uh, created, and established a forum group, that is the World Forum for the Harmonization of Vehicle Regulation, that works a lot, both to include in this frame 
also country out of Europe. There are some countries out of Europe following this approach, like Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, and others, but also to work in, pa in pairs with other countries like China, United States that follow their rules. If you see the body, the full body of the regulation, you can identify at least four regulations that I put in the slide that are very relevant in case of electric vehicle. The electromagnetic compatibility, there are 10, because obviously electric vehicle with switching system, high frequency switching systems in the controller are in general affected by higher potential EMC, EMI compatibility and interference problem higher than a traditional car. The R85, that is a specific regulation to measure the performance of the propulsion system. There's also a fiscal impact, obviously. And then the well-known R100, that is the mother regulation to reach the approval for a better electric vehicle, because it's the one that cover electrical, thermal, and mechanical safety and specific performance requirement. For instance, in the last version, also the correct insulation of the vehicle after a crash is verified and measured. And finally, the R101, that in the case of an electric vehicle is bracket simply a regulation to measure the energy consumption and the vehicle range. While in a traditional car, the R101 is covering also all the emission, noxious emission part. Also, in case uh, we are not speaking standard car production, but we are speaking about a transformation, like uh, probably is one of your more typical cases in Nepal, um, is very important to take care of that, because in general, at least for passenger cars and typical goods, uh, transportation vehicle, M and class typically they are called, um, in the transformation, even if you start from a donor vehicle coming from a company producing this vehicle, for instance, with a diesel engine, and this company give you the authorization to transform, that means all the homologation of the base part comes with the vehicle without asking to re-homologate them, tires, uh, windscreen, uh, all the traditional part doors of the car, for instance. Uh, anyway, the company modifying the vehicle has to follow the four regulation mentioned before to uh, cover the regulation of the extra part, the part related to the specific electrical um, element. Uh, if I understood correctly at the moment, uh, in your country, the uh, rules and the transformation are in progress, maybe it will be totally different, but in general, having in mind these four uh, pillars, uh, you can have clear which are the area, particularly for the, uh, the, the safety aspect, the first, the third, and the fourth, uh, that has to be anyway, some way covered to have a product that is not only compliant uh, for the air quality as an electric vehicle, is not also in terms of usage. Uh, moving to the standard, that is the scope of this presentation, I will speak to you about two family of standards. One is the ISO, ISO is International Organization for Standardization, is an independent non-governmental international organization that produce a lot of standards through the voluntary consensus-based market relevant activity of experts of the different partners and members that belongs to it. Uh, in particular, the, um, uh, the ISO is covering plenty of issues, is also speaking about road vehicles, it is one a little piece of this big puzzle, but is the one at which we refer now, that is the Technical Committee 22. Uh, ISO is organizing committees, more than 100, and the number 22 is the one uh, looking at the road vehicles uh, uh, and cover the very different typology, as you can see, from mopeds, motorcycles, motor vehicle, trailer, and different typology of that, combination vehicle, and also articulated vehicles. So cover from the two wheelers up to the big trucks. To, be uh, simple. Under the Technical Committee 22, there are a lot of subcommittees, among which there is in particular this one that has interest, very interest on electric vehicle, and particularly the number 37, that is specifically the electrically propelled vehicle uh, devoted to one. These subcommittees organize in different working group, touching different topics, from safety to performance, to the battery part, for instance, to the part of connection to the grid for the charging, and so on. 
uh, and is generally producing standard applicable directly to M1 and one vehicles, so traditional passenger cars and um, goods transportation uh, vehicle up to 1,500 kilogram, uh, 3,000, sorry, 500 kilogram. But sometimes uh, uh, some of the standard also applied to bigger vehicles and to smaller. For the smallers in general, uh, two wheelers, for instance, uh, uh, in general, the, the standard can be found in the subcommittee tertiary activity, where in general they start from the SC37 written for passenger cars, for instance, and modify that in order to fit better the two, -wheel, uh, two, two wheeler needs. A few steps just to give you a flavor, and obviously we'll not enter in detail. In the, this ASO area, there are standards referred to the operation of the vehicle on the road, are standard devoted to evaluate uh, acceleration, constant speed, uh, gradability in different conditions with standardized test method, uh, as is uh, as like uh, the uh, consumption, energy consumption and range part, the second of these two. In this area, there are also performance testing devoted to the battery packs and system, in particular for lithium ion that is becoming, at least in the modern electric vehicle, the most common solution, even if not the cheapest and powerful. As said before, the motorcycle and mopeds starting from the standard derived their one. If you see, for instance, the standard 13064 in the two parts written here is the uh, cover uh, applied to the two wheelers of the first two written for traditional cars. And that is, for instance, for the lithium battery, this standard here is the twin of this one. Um, another important area, as said before, is the part uh, regarding uh, the safety issues. The safety issues are uh, very, very uh, relevant. And in particular, uh, also before them, the uh, testing of the components. The testing of the components uh, to verify that the required specification are in line with what we want. The first two standards you see here, part one and two of this uh, 21498, are devoted to the voltage classes. There are a lot of voltage classes. In a few seconds, I will give you some hint how to move among the voltage classes and the electrical test of the components. While to verify the performance for the different components, you see the second standard with this family of parts that cover from testing of motor, motor and inverter, DC-DC converter, bridging the 12 volt part of the car with the battery one and all the components. As you can see by the year written in the brackets, this standard has been uh, become available in the last year because there is a big request of this standard to support the diffusion of electric vehicle worldwide. In a side uh, subcommittee, the 32, uh, you can find standards for the environmental condition for all the electric and electronic components. It's very useful and powerful to verify that the components are uh, fitting the requirement in terms of temperature, in terms of humidity, in terms of vibration, or what you can need. And the second block that is more referred to uh, issue like cables, of different voltage levels and uh, um, connectors of them. Back to the point of safety mentioned before, a very, very important standard in ISO domain is this one, the 6469. That is a standard in four parts, as you can see, that covers safety, electrical safety in this case as first, uh, covering the very different part uh, in the game. As the battery system, the part one, as the vehicle under operation, part two, as the uh, electrical shock issue that you can find in part three. Electrical shock is uh, the so called electrocution and typically take place uh, if you put your hands, uh, naked hands, uh, in contact to the full voltage of a battery with a voltage level of some hundreds of volt. In general, the risky voltages are in the plant where there are experienced people in uh, environmental condition under control, 120. So all what is under 120 is considered low voltage, all, all what is over 120 high voltage. In the usage that is not in a plant, but is in the road, it can be after a crash, can be done by generalist uh, user that are not expert 
when they have a job, they are not professional users, so I want the issues. This number has been reduced to one half to make more safe the story. And so the threshold is 60 volt, meaning that all what is under 60 volt, both the 12, the traditional car, let me say, and the 48 volt, that I see you are evaluating, uh, starting from the mini mild hybrid components to make a smaller three wheelers in electrical form, are safe by themselves, meaning you do not risk the the shock anyway, while the other like buses and duffel and cars that are hundred and hundred volt more and more has to follow this regulation to guarantee the protection against the shock. And you see the picture of the shock on the right side. Another element to be taken into account is the arc, so interruption of current in a conductor in which current is flowing, and that's unlikely to take place independently from the voltage level. So it's something you have to face independently if you are in high low voltage condition. Here you see again for the two wheelers, uh, the standards that are under progress that are, as you can see, one to one, the copy and paste of this tripartite in terms of title, but we'll review the car standard for a different vehicle like it is a two wheeler. And here you see other elements regarding uh, another important domain that is uh, the safety of the connection. Charging electric vehicle means to connect the vehicle to high voltage source, and in this case, high voltage is unlawfully. Even if uh, grid guys call high voltage more than 100, 5000 volt is anyway dangerous. If you touch 220 volt, you can uh, have a severe effect. And so it's very important to guarantee also the safety both in the left picture, that is conduction, conductive connection, so cable, pantograph, uh, something that put in direct physical contact, like a plug and socket with copper conductor in the middle, or you do through the air, like this wireless solution, in this case, inductive solution. And this standard is some way covering in the part two, part three, this part. ACDC depends on if it is standard charge with charge on board or DC first charge with charge of board, and the wireless one, this one. A fifth part has been added particularly for the pantograph charging of the buses, and in this case, buses that in general are not 100% following this ISO family of standard, ask that this part is explicitly for the automatic connection of the pantograph to the buses, for instance. Again, also in this case, uh, the two wheelers has their standards, uh, as you can see, it's not so new, it's 2015. That means that probably in the next year they will run through a more detailed analysis, depending also on the solution of, among these that fits that wheeler, maybe not a pantograph, obviously. Um, this is the domain of ICE. Another important domain is the domain of IEC, that is the Electrotechnical, International Electrotechnical Commission, that is in general taking care of all the electrical standards. Is again, a worldwide organization is ISO, but is focused on electricity. Is the one managing, for instance, uh, issue also like plant or like uh, washing machine, or what is connected to a grid. Uh, as you can easily understand, they can cover very important element useful also for automotive in terms of components, general standard, and particular the two bodies, ISO and IC, have to find a way to work together when we speak about charging, because charging is the condition where I put the vehicle and the grid together. As you've seen before, we are looking to the safety requirements on the vehicle side. But obviously, the safety of this system is true if the full system is safe, not only one part of the two. If you are electrocuted, you are not so much happy if you, are, uh, if you know that the problem is not your car, but it's the grid. And the end of problem is the same for the user. And so, uh, again, this is an important uh, area of cooperation, sometimes also of, uh, find a way to operate. In previous year, at the beginning, it was not so easy to match the two big players. Can make us look at, um, typically, this device as a big lobbyist player, like energy provider is in mind on the side. For them, a car under charge has to be considered like a washing machine. We are not on the same position. So we have to find a way to be effective each other. In particular, the Technical Committee 69 is the one having in charge all the standards. I know that you have tomorrow also the voted day on charging, so I don't want to go into all this very wide detail, but just as a reference, have this slide in which you can find all the multiple, as you can see, there are two pages of part of this very relevant standard, the 61851, that is the IC side, so the grid size standard for the conductive cable and connector plugs and socket standard for charging system. 
moving from the general requirements, entering in this part on the EMC issues, the part 21.2, and then going to the very different op option that goes from AC to DC charging on board, off board. And there are plenty of the standard. As you can see, all of them very, very new because the standard have in general to be refreshed after a few years. But in this case, sometimes I really, really, as you can see, edition one, very new for the big evolution that the question of the charging of the battery is taking place. Side information, maybe for your vehicle, not so much relevant, but for your reference, there are also standards very similar in terms of general structure that covers the wireless. The previous were covering, we said, the conductive cable and, and the connectors. Here is a transfer of energy through the air, for instance, with a primary in the ground and a receiver under the car. Uh, another important part is the one regarding the plugs. Uh, maybe for your three wheelers, plugs uh, are the traditional. You don't use today electrical devoted plugs, uh, but undoubtedly, if you speak about buses, uh, I feel it's not the case to use a Shuko or something less than this. Here you see some standards uh, on the connectors, the physical connectors, uh, the typical European family. Type 2, this upper part, and this combined called CCS2, mentioned by Mass also before. And here, the, the, the twin for the US Japanese market. The difference is that this works in the AC side only in single phase, while this one can work single and three phase. On the right, I put also this connector that is called Type 3, that is specific for smaller vehicles, three, four wheelers. Uh, and motorbikes that want to be charged in public place under all the safety rules defined in the previous standard as in principle to use this device. While obviously in practice, they typically continue to use a shook or something like that, meaning without a check of insulation of all the parts, without a, very, a check of the temperature and possible over temperature condition. And so with higher risk in case the process is not going as expected. Um, Okay, this is what I told you before. We can go on, yeah. And here there are other important standards. Maybe at the moment for Nepal, uh, at least the main part of the application, the problem is how to connect to the grids and charge the vehicle full stop. And the more the electrification becomes wider, the more complex becomes the story and the more uh, complex become the way to match it. Meaning that the RR standard for the communication vehicle charging point, but then there are standard between this charging point as this player called the charging service operator, that maybe it can be an aggregator of different charging physical place in different uh, location, up to the so-called immobility service provider that can be the company producing electricity is not. And as you can see, to make this three guys speak each other, you need the three class of standards acting together, of which one that is established today and the other that are, as you can see by this text, at least in part, still in progress. So it's very easy in the general communication, say anything is easy, make on electric, it will be a big game, electricity can be shared very easily, all correct, but the way is not so, so easy as it seems. Uh, this one is a common ISO IC standard in the field, well known 1511A, that covers all the conductive and wireless communication part. A very important part is this part 20 that is coming to the end after thanks and more years of discussion of 400 players with very different point of view. It's very relevant because among the different parts that add to the addition to the part 20, the, sorry, to the part two, the part 20 has inside the standards element to open the bidirectionality. So make possible what is called vehicle to grid. So the fact that the vehicle sometimes can also transfer energy to the grid and only to be charged. For instance, depending on the hour of the day or depending on some cost or some opportunities. I see as also the standard, you can see that some of them, one under progress that try to manage at system level of this opportunity coming from the active role of the vehicle through the grids, so not only a load, but sometimes also a generator to stabilize the grid, for instance, are in this last standard you see there. And then, I don't know how much is in your country relevant or not, I put a slide also on the swapping. 
Uh, Roping, for instance, in Taiwan, I know Gogoro is very, very popular. For small vehicles, it seems to be very logical. I know that motorbike players like Yamaha, like uh, Honda, like uh, Piaggio are working together to define standards for the battery to be swapped. And here you see uh, already existing and some new evolution in progress, the standards that are applicable to make safe the switching of the battery from the vehicle. Again, I said at the beginning, if I am on a small vehicle with 48 volt battery, I can do with no big risk, avoiding to make a short circuit on the battery, obviously. If I want to swap the battery of a car, like in this example, high voltage asks for very different approaches. Also, the weight of the pack is 100 of kilogram, and you cannot do with your hands easily, like it is for a bus at the end. About repair and maintenance, something uh, very reasonable and very correct has been already said by Umesh before. Um, I put just two standards that are general standard for make easier a standardized repair and maintenance process. This is for cars at this stage. It's justified for very stabilized high volumes. For you, the big point is shown here. Obviously, putting the hands on every vehicle, it's important to have the proper protection, personal protection equipment. And these are obviously gloves, uh, are a helmet, uh, can be glasses, uh, but can be also the proper voltage instrument to measure the voltage, the proper screw driver insulated to operate on the, uh, on the system. So that's a very important part to make uh, safe the user of electric vehicle that obviously ask for technical experience. If this is applied and known, I agree on the sentence, electric vehicles are better, simpler, less critical, more easy, more easy to be maintained than a conventional car. Otherwise, the advantages that are evident on motor versus engine or uh, filtering for emissions that are not existing in electric vehicle, uh, or maybe usage uh, or, use, or brakes, assuming the same weight of the vehicle, because there, there is a regenerative braking, can have as a counterpart uh, the problem coming from the battery. The battery is not a tank. Fuel tank is easy to be managed. It's a piece of plastic metal with some liquid inside when uh, full filled. Battery is a living element that also, when considered depleted uh, as a voltage, can create short circuit, can create over voltage, thermal runaway, emission of noxious gases, uh, toxical. The more energy we want in the system, the more uh, risky can become this part. And so it's very important to correctly address the usage. If it is done, that will be called a shining story. Otherwise, you see by also an interesting picture, some fires on electric vehicles becomes very, very difficult for fiber gas to be extinguished more than what it is in a traditional car. OK, time is going to the end. I put you for you just three slides at the end. Uh, maybe you don't know it. Uh, maybe yes. If not, uh, in Europe today is very popular this approach called Euroncap. Euroncap uh, is a way to try to evaluate uh, through a star method, one, two, three, four, five stars, at the level of safety, real safety of a vehicle, independent if it is electric or thermal. And today is uh, covering four areas, is evaluating how much is safe for the adult inside the car, who drives, who is sitting close to, child, child occupants and uh, all the possible risks they have under crash, for instance, vulnerable road users, so the vehicle has some way also to take care of the possible pedestrian and cyclist that can go against this vehicle, obviously not an intentional way, and for modern car and modern the safety assist system, so the so-called EDAS uh, and also um, autonomous driving like uh, side level two, three uh, supporting element. Here is explained which type of tests are done to verify that. For the adult occupant protection, generally is crash issues, so frontal lateral crash and so on. And also the assessment of measure to take out people from the car after crash. For the child occupant, obviously the restraint system for child are considered in a very different condition. For the vulnerable, as said, is also be added, uh, for instance, the presence of cyclists as possible vulnerable road user. And here, the fact that the vehicle can have, for instance, an IEB system, so an automatic emergency braking that helps 
under extreme condition to automatically stop the car before to go against uh, someone crossing the road, uh, not on the streets, but just um, appearing in front of you so fast that you cannot react with the physiology of the human being. And last, as I said before, the safety assist system like uh, cruise control, uh, advanced cruise control system, and so on. Uh, this is native for cars, M1, but is also applied on AV quadricycles. And this is very, very powerful because in the AV quadricycles, at least in Europe, but if you, in the same is in your case, the vehicle can be put on the road, can be homologated at the end, without passing crash tests before. Assuming the vehicle going at low speed and so no risky. That is potentially true if this vehicle is in a controlled environment without traditional car trucks and buses. If these vehicles are, as happens today, also in the middle of the traffic of the others, the risk comes from the others. And at this point, um, the fact that to reach a certain star rating also for this vehicle is performed through, as it is shown in the lower part of the slide, two full-scale crash tests uh, is very important. Uh, don't forget that when you uh, transform, for instance, a vehicle, uh, today, in general, the battery maker guarantee you in terms of battery behavior if the battery is not affected, uh, is not impacted by the crash deformation. And as you can see by the picture, that's not so obvious. If imagine you had the battery in the front of the car, the idea that the battery not uh, impacted, mechanically impacted by the crash is just a lean. So this test help to verify in advance that the vehicle can, in the real traffic, be safe as obviously want is it. Okay, that's all. I stop this long list. I'm sure that too many information, but I also expect that having this list, maybe you can find in the list standards that can be of interest for you to take inspiration, for instance, to have your standard locally. If you can just as a final sentence, it's common to say who yeah. arrives after later is that as the advantage not to make the mistake of who was before. That's true if you know which were the mistakes. Taking advantage of looking at the standard, understanding and modifying as you need is the best way to avoid to do what we already missed in the past a lot of times with electrification. So it's 30 years that I'm working in the field and we're still waiting for the day in which uh, the main part of the car on the road will be electric. I was enrolled in my company for this park was in 92. We are still in the progress. We are in a long way. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for sharing your, your decades of experience here in this, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes of the slide. Uh, uh, we have some questions for you, Vittorio. I think you are staying. So, but uh, without losing your time, I would like we to can invite- the, Yeah, exactly. Uh, after yeah, yeah. after Doc Mani. Yeah, so, no problem. Yeah, so I will like to invite uh, Doc Mani. So, so we'll, you can see my screen, yeah, okay. So, Doc Mani, uh, Dr. Jose uh, Bienvenido Mani Boina uh, from De La Salle uh, University in the Philippines uh, present on electric tricycles, uh, uh, specification operations and economics. Uh, he's an expert in areas of sustainable mobility, environmental modeling, energy modeling, EVs and smart mobility. He's also executive director of EVAP. He leads the development of smart uh, electric vehicle and intelligent charging network system to be piloted in Solutions Plus uh, project in Pasig City. Uh, he's uh, also technical, a technology advisor and member of, a member of boards of Tojo Motors. Uh, yeah, uh, Doc Mani, so floor is yours. Uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Ritu. Uh, yeah. So uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Is it good afternoon here? It's afternoon here in the Philippines. Yeah, so I'll be talking about electric tricycle specification operations and economics. I guess there will be a lot of parallelism between uh, Kathmandu and Philippines in terms of the vehicles that we're using. So I'll be talking about tricycles in the Philippines. Where do we use them, for example? Uh, then recently, there's a change in face of tricycles. I'm gonna talk about the e-track technologies in the country economics, operations, design, and viability. And um, I guess the session is mostly, is, would want to focus also on retrofitting. So I'm gonna answer that, that question also to retrofit or not, and then some key points. Yeah. So tricycles in the Philippines. 
um, is used for public or family transport. It's a very popular mode of transport. Uh, apparently, there's around 650,000 official public transport units. Official in the sense that uh, they are licensed by the government, but uh, normally uh, we would always say that uh, you double that, that is the actual number actually of tricycles. So the vehicle kilometer, daily vehicle kilometer, vehicle, the, uh, the vehicle kilometer travel ranges from 40 to 100 kilometers per day. And normally it's used for last mile. And, uh, but in the provinces, um, it's basically the main mode of transport. So it's used for intra-city municipality uh, uh, services or mobility. It's mostly used in local roads in urban areas, but uh, since in the provinces is the main mode of transport, public transport, then they're also often used in, in main roads. And it comes in different forms. So you will see in there, they could come in, in a two, 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 four passenger capacity configuration. So you can have also six up to 10, but uh, actually the capacity is just a, a number in the Philippines. Because even though a tricycle is configured to be occupied by four passengers, but normally we go beyond that. So you will see there in the pictures. I think it's pretty much the same also as in, as in, uh, as in Kathmandu. Yeah, uh, just a changing phase of a uh, Philippine tricycle. So as you will see previously, it's the tricycle is normally a, a motorcycle fitted with a sidecar. Okay, but in recent years, um, the, the country has been adopting, the, uh, the, the country has been adopting the Bajaj, um, configurations, vehicles, the Bajaj RE. I think it's, this is also mostly from South, uh, South Asia. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, this is also becoming very popular now. And also, in the, in the past years, the number of electric tricycles have been increasing in the country. So, you will see in there uh, the different tricycles. Uh, the, the one with the, with, the, with the girl, that is a China made tricycle. The one with the light green, that is a Philippine made tricycle. The one with the white, that is a Philippine-made tricycle. This was after the project of the Philippine government. And the third one, uh, this was the first, uh, the initial uh, models of tricycle, electric tricycles that were rolled out. So it's basically an electric motorcycle fitted also with a, with, a, uh, with a sidecar. Yeah, a look at the technology. So right now, I'd like to focus more on the one what's the, what's the, that was developed with the Philippine government and rolled out locally. So. Uh, normally, tricycles, or as I've said, um, they either operate in main roads or in, in, in side streets or in uh, internal roads. But uh, the one that I'm going to discuss first is the one operating on main roads. So those operating on main roads are normally bigger capacity tricycles. And uh, normally, the, the speed picks around 35, 40 kilometers. So this is the actual drive cycle. And if you're going to convert that to the speed power distribution curve, you end up at around uh, four, four kilowatts uh, rated, and then uh, you could peak, at, uh, which could have a peak uh, do double that, that, that value. So that should be enough. So normally these tricycles are rated at four kilowatts, having a battery of 4.2 kilowatts lithium iron phosphate batteries, normally the range is 50 kilometers. So the normal uh, energy economy of these tricycles is around 15, 13 to 15 kilometers per liter. And the uh, passenger capacity is uh, six passengers plus one driver. And this costs around 350,000 pesos. So in dollars, that's around $7,000. 7, yeah. So what are the economics behind yeah, this type of tricycles? So I'm sure pretty familiar with the Bajaj type of tricycles. Yeah. I'm going to take the bigger one. In the Philippines, we have two types, the Bajaj RE and the Bajaj Max Maze. So the Bajaj Maximus is a bigger one, having a capacity comparable to, to the tricycle that we call that, that electric tricycle that we're, that we are comparing it with. So investments of the electric tricycle, as mentioned earlier, is around 350,000 pesos. Okay, normally, and that, that comes already with the with the, with, with the battery, but normally these tricycles are operated via battery swapping. So which means then that uh, the operator needs to buy a spare battery or you're going to rent out a spare battery from the battery swapping service provider. But it's a common practice to just rent it. You're, you're just to rent it and use also your battery when you swap, swap it as some sort of a deposit. Yeah. So yeah. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you look at the economics, uh, it provides positive uh, financial uh, net, um, uh, net present value. So that's good. 
Okay, however, uh, how come this is not readily adopted? Okay, there are several main issues. Number one, higher initial cost. Okay, the Philippines, the operators or the classicals uh, normally comes from the low income uh, sector. So they don't have the capacity to really um, fund the acquisition of these vehicles. And uh, which means they, 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 most of the time they, they loan these vehicles from the providers themselves, which would, which would uh, put in a lot of inter, high, high interest rates as, as high as 15, 20% uh, per, per annum. And so, so which means then that economics is very, it's very uh, sensitive to it's very sensitive to to um, to the uh, to the initial cost. So the higher initial cost, although in the long term it has positive uh, returns, the higher initial cost is a major concern. Uh, since uh, currently there's no policy yet to to mandate the adoption of this vehicle, so most of the operators would still choose the Bajaj Maximize um, units. So number one, higher initial cost, and then operational limitations. As I've said, these tricycles only uh, are fitted with batteries in 50 kilometer range. You normally they operate more than 50 kilometers, even up to 70 kilometers or 100 kilometers in some cases. By the way, the economic figures that you would see here, these were based on the 70 kilometer uh, daily range, which is, which is actually the average. So. Uh, it has operational limitations, and since they operate based on the battery swapping uh, system, so it means they're mostly con their operations are mostly confined around around where the battery say battery swapping stations are. But as you should, as you as you would have seen, these tricycles are already used as public transport, and in some cases they're also being used by the families okay, you know, as, as private transport. So uh, flexibility is very important. And that becomes now a major issue. So the limited range becomes a major issue. So there's a performance issue. So that's why a lot of people still, a lot of uh, operators still choose to, to acquire the Bajaj Maximize. Uh, limited financing options, as I've said earlier, nor mostly the, the, the financing is being provided by the, uh, by the uh, vehicle suppliers themselves and would levy very high interest rates. Um, this, as again, this, this sector, uh, the operators are coming from the low income families and they don't normally have access to bank financing which have which offers lower interest rates so their their loans are not being improved because of lack of credit uh, because of uh, credit worthiness issues so they, they don't have a choice but to, but to resort to uh, loan sharks or to resort to the high or to accept the high interest rates provided by the suppliers themselves and um in some cases um they don't satisfy the minimum daily BKT that would uh, ensure viability of the electric adoption of electric bicycles over the Bajaj Maximize. And uh, okay, there are also issues on the varying operational regime. So I'm going to discuss more about those later. Oh, sorry. Okay, so so what, what do we do then? Higher initial cost. So one way would be to it would be to, and then you have issues in performance, and you have also, also issues at initial cost. So one, one, one way that the, you know, the local sector is looking at, the local industry is looking at right now, is to, you know, to offer them without the batteries, to, to sell them without the batteries, and then lease out the batteries. So, and then these batteries that, are, that will be leased out are, are of bigger capacity. So having capacities of 100, 100 kilowatt hour, uh, 100 kilometers. So, so th that would be possible now because um, it's not part, the battery cost is not part of your of your vehicle cost. So you can increase now the, the capacity of your battery and then just rent it out. Yeah. So that that is one strategy, and then you can do home charging normally at night because the, the range of the of the battery is enough to cover the, the requirements of the whole day. And then, as I said, you do uh, you acquire this through battery uh, through battery these things. So you don't buy the battery. And this brings down your, this cuts down the cost difference of the, the Bajaj Maximize electric bicycles to, to, uh, to acceptable uh, levels. Another option is to maintain the battery size, but uh, adopt fast charging batteries. So you don't need a spare battery in this case. So, and then you just uh, charge it really quick whenever you need to, to charge. But in both cases, the batteries will be less out. However, when you list out the batteries, you need to uh, have certain technologies. Of course, uh, your, your battery pack needs to have certain technological features. So 
I uh, have listened to hear the battery leasing technology in the years that we're, okay, we're, we're integrating in the battery packs right now. So the battery packs that we're integrating includes the GPS tracking of the batteries. Of course, batteries are very expensive. It's important that we're able to track them. Next is the remote condition monitoring, maintenance, and control. So we monitor the uh, performance of the batteries. We monitor the discharge, discharge charge efficiencies remotely. We're able to monitor the temperature of the batteries and we're able to, and um, uh, we apply AI to, to, um, to, uh, to detect whether there are uh, problems with the, with the batteries. And uh, when, when we learn about that, then uh, we will be able to call the attention of the uh, operator and then replace a battery uh, that we have loaned to him uh, before the battery eventually gets totally destroyed. And we can do also a remote uh, maintenance uh, calibration of the batteries. And then uh, when, when the, uh, when the uh, operators are, not, are able to pay their dues, then we have the option also to remotely cut off uh, a supply to the, to the vehicle. Uh, we're also integrating tamper tracing and proofing. Uh, tamper tracing in the sense that Filipinos are very, uh, are very technology, uh, um, I, I don't know. I don't know how can I say that. Uh, it's, um, they're very technology curious. So they would want to think or think uh, on, on things. And of course, these are very, very expensive equipment. So, so we have integrated some tamper tracing and proofing uh, Tamper tracing and proofing uh, features in the in the battery in the battery, uh, so that we know whether the battery is being tampered. Okay, and also some charging encryption because they're supposed to be charged only using the, the batteries that we provide. So, so in case they they're they're being charged with using other chargers, uh, the, the batteries will charge up. So the batteries are encrypted. So yeah. So uh, battery leasing would be a good way to, to look at, but of course you have to ensure that okay, you're, you're able to protect all the investment also of the, of, the, of the investor. Yeah. Now, daily mileage, uh, BKT design, and then uh, economics. So we are looking at all three configurations. In one would be a 50 kilometer battery a vehicle with a, with a spare battery for swapping. Okay, the other one would be a hundred kilometer uh, slow charging battery. Uh, then um, it's permanent on the vehicle and it's being charged at home at the end of the day. Then the third one is a fast charging battery at which you can charge in time of day at a really fast rate. So um, how do their economics change with the uh, with the BKTs, with the, with the daily uh, vehicle kilometers traveled? So if you look at, for example, in here, for the base battery, so that so the base battery is a slow charging battery. The the uh, high range, the higher range battery batteries also a slow charging battery. And uh, okay, there, there are certain uh, is points that we can we can, can assert in here. Um, for slow charging batteries, if the daily BKT is less than the range, so that is the case. That is the case of the. Uh, of the uh, uh, 50 kilometer battery. So the range, as I've said, is 70 kilometers, right? Uh, 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 no, sorry, sorry, uh, we, we vary the, 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 the daily mileage. So, so, so if the um, range goes beyond 50 kilometers now, then as you would see, you would see that the uh, economics goes down. Why does it goes down? It means that you have to adopt, you have to rent a, a spare battery. Okay, unlike if it's just within the range of the, uh, the range of the of, of a single battery, and then beyond that, then the economics starts to pick up again, because you 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 uh, obtain more savings as you travel more, because uh, your your savings base depends on the difference between the energy costs of the gas of the of the ICE and and the uh, and the electricity that you that you consume. Uh, if the VKT is greater than the range, the daily v, the daily VKT is greater than the range. Ah, so sorry, that's the first one. If the daily BKT is greater than the range, so it goes up, your economics then goes down when it reaches the range of the battery, and then it starts to pick up again. Uh, if the BKT is less than the range, so that is the case of the 100 kilometer battery, then it just go, goes up until it reaches your, its uh, okay, the limit. So in this case, it's from 20 kilometers up to 100 kilometers, that is still within the range of the battery. So it continuously okay, goes up and 
Um, now you would ask, how come there's a difference between between the base battery and the uh, and the higher range battery? Because if you're do if you're adopting a higher range battery, your vehicle is a lot is a, a lot heavier, so that cuts down also a bit your energy your energy economy. Uh, and then of course the optimum it would be okay, all, all, would be always a case where in your daily B80 is equal to your ratio. You're able to maximize the ratio battery and at the same time, you don't have to rent an extra, an extra, uh, an extra battery. But for fast charging batteries, okay, then uh, it just goes up, okay, with the, with the daily, with the daily B80. Of course, it could always be argued that okay, as your V80 increases, it needs to get to charge more of the batteries. That's going to cut down the life of the batteries. Okay, but uh, okay, whatever battery cost would that additional battery cost would that entail is being superseded by the savings provided by the difference in the electricity cost and the and the fuel cost. Oh, and here operational regimes. Okay, Philippines right now is, is transitioning into a modern public transport system. So it and it starts by rationalizing the roads. Okay, tricycles were introduced before to serve routes which are too small, which have passed through the pressure of demands that are too small for for the jeepneys. So I don't know if you've seen some jeepneys. So jeepneys these are like uh, 16 to 20 passenger uh, vehicles and they have fixed routes. So um, okay, before um, there still, there were a lot of routes that don't have enough capacity to support the operations of these bigger vehicles. So tricycles were introduced. Okay, but now passenger, passenger uh, demands have changed. So that's why the government is doing some rationalization work. So some of the tricycle routes will be, will be um, replaced by the jeepney routes. Some routes will be replaced by modern PUV routes, uh, PUVs. These are like mini buses. And then some of the mini buses, mini bus routes will be, uh, will be served now by, by the bus routes. So the question now is, uh, okay, where, where do we, where, where, how, how do we use now the electric tricycles? Okay, they are too big compared to the tricycles that are used in internal roads. But uh, they are also too small compared to the electric jeepneys. So, and in terms of comp and co uh, competitiveness economically, then you have an issue when you compare the economics of a big uh, of, of these tricycles, electric tricycles to the jeepneys. Then you have also problems when you compare okay, these bigger tricycles with the electric tricycles with the smaller tricycles. So with, that means then that uh, there's a need to develop. A new type of so if the tricycle operation will be confined to internal roads only, and these tricycles are too big, so that that it means there's a need to, to to redefine the design of this of this tricycle. So, so we got some um, some uh, tricycle data for in the internal roads, and then similar what what that we've done before. So if that's the speed the power distribution, and um, if we adopt, for example, a two kilowatt a traction motor that, that basically involves most of the operating points. And then the peak uh, loads could be handled by the peak, uh, peak power of the, of the motor. And then you can still maintain a 50 kilometer, uh, 50 kilometer uh, range, a 2.5 kilowatt um, battery pack. Okay, so you need now a smaller battery because you're just operating in internal roads with, with, with lesser number of passengers and also the uh, the dry cycles are not too taxing for the for the battery, and um, okay, that brings down your cost two hundred fifty thousand. Okay, that is with one battery, attached low slow slow charging battery, and then you adopt you just rent out a second one. So um, then the NPV would now be uh, the financial net present value will now look somewhat like this. So fifty kilometers slow charging battery, as we've said before. If the economics improves, and then suddenly when it reaches the, the range of the battery, it goes down because you need now to rent a second battery during swapping, and then it goes up again. Okay, but if, if you're going to use, let's say, the bigger tricycles in these routes, then you won't have the, you won't have the economics. Now, uh, some would ask, how come it won't have economics? Then it, it can carry more passengers. Okay, but normally, the internal, the internal tricycles uh, operate on a point, point, point or like a taxi service. So normally you, you hail one, you, your group rides it, and then you, you're, you're being, uh, you're being uh, um, driven to your, to, to your, to your uh, selected destination okay, within, the, 
with, within the area. So the uh, bigger capacity won't really help in, in the internal road operations. Now, there's also the question of why not retrofit? Okay, number one, this lack of standards. So there's a lot, I'm, I'm part of the um, technical committee uh, developing the standards. So what we basically do there is just look at the existing standards, evaluate whether they're applicable to the country or not. And yes, it was mentioned earlier, regulations is different from the standards. So right now, there's a lack of standards that may be adopted uh, internationally. Um, later on, I'm going to mention that the government is now funding a study to develop local standards for this one. So number one, lack of technical standards. That is very, very important if you want to do retrofit. Next, um, retrofitting would have some issue with the, with the initiatives right now in the Philippines because we're not just looking at changing the power train, but we're looking at the whole design. As you will see in here, the, the old configuration where you have your motorcycle, then you have a bicycle on the right, um, is very inconvenient for, for the passengers. It's not, it's not that comfortable. So that's why um, even without the regulations, the uh, tricycle sector has been adopting the okay, the, 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 the judge RE because the passenger, the um, commuting public choose to ride them over uh, over the old uh, the old design. So okay, there is that shift right now. So so retrofitting the old configurations is, is also now a big question whether that makes sense or not, especially that most of them are, are already so old. And as I've said earlier, government is now started funding a study um, to look at the sense of okay, coming up first with the standards. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, to look at the sense of first uh, introducing or adopting uh, um, um, retrofitting of uh, older tricycles to electrics. And then if it makes sense, then the study also looks at developing a local uh, a homegrown standards for for uh, retrofit uh, kits for, for, for uh, the old tricycles. So before I end, some, just some key points. Uh, performance, initial costs, and long-term economics, these are the enabler, these are the key factors that needs to be satisfied to, to facilitate the adoption of electric tricycles. Um, and it's very important always to to, uh, to come up with, to adopt the right solution. And that starts by defining the operational parameters. And that's gonna, decide, that's gonna dictate your, your um, the design of your tricycles. So you look for the right solution and the best solution may not always be the, may not always be the one. In fact, okay, why not just a, an electric, uh, a, a pedelec, a pedelec, um, a pedelec um, um, tricycle, for example. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mani, for giving us the detail on the operational and economic aspects of e-tricycle, including the perspective in Philippines. Uh, it is, also, of course, uh, like a uh, city needs to look into the local needs uh, to define the right solution, yes. Uh, with this, I will go through some questions. Uh, so I just want to ask you to pose some questions in the chat box if you have any. Uh, so we have uh, earlier three speakers. So I just put some questions of business. Uh, we have okay. some more detail so, on that. Yeah. So the battery swapping business in the in the Philippines is uh, mostly operated by the uh, vehicle suppliers themselves. Because uh, the problem with the, as mentioned earlier, the problem with the operators, they don't, they have limited the financial capacity to invest. So normally this is invested on by the operators, them, by the suppliers themselves. And in some cases, it's a, uh, it's a joint venture. Yeah. And um, okay, the main issue with battery swapping is um, it adds actual cost on, on the operations of the vehicles. Because unlike direct charging, a battery swapping will require greater or more human resource cost. So uh, that is the main issue. But in some cases, that is the only solution that you can have because um, in the Philippines, it is the suppliers, although they are better financially compared to the operators, 
the vehicle suppliers and manufacturers in the Philippines for tricycles are also are, are not big companies really. These are also small and medium enterprises, so they cannot also invest on a lot a, a lot on the battery on 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 on, on, the, on bigger batteries to be list out. So, so that's why right now the main strategy is to bring in third party investors on the on the on on the battery um, themselves. So, so normally they would go to the battery swapping stations normally during midday and then their battery gets swaps and the swapping time is around 15 minutes. So I hope I answered your question. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Patmani. Uh, just related to that, uh, I have a question from my colleague Alvin to Vittorio. Uh, so if you would advise Nepal or other countries in the region where light vehicles are more dominant and moving towards stronger electrification of uh, LEVs like two-wheelers and three-wheelers, uh, which would you say are the main standards that need to be prioritized and set in place as soon as possible? Or where should they start? Yeah, I feel that our lesson and before, I feel the most relevant uh, from my experience are the safety. Because we want to promote a new technology to have a better life, to better quality of the air and so on. And if it comes with vehicles that are unsafe, uh, the message is lost and the vehicles are not used use because people uh, become skeptical on them. And the other, I feel, uh, are the one regarding, uh, but th this largely depends on the way in which you want to put the vehicle on the way, uh, on the road, the charging part. Because at the end, uh, a battery works uh, if uh, a model to charge the battery with swapping, with fast charging, with standard charging can be done. It's not a matter of today, but for instance, there are new lithium technologies that for vehicle-like two-wheelers, where the total energy is very limited, can open the door, to very, the door to very high fast charging, so very short term, without big, 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 big power. So for the two wheelers, I feel that both swapping and this technology open the door to three wheelers to very interesting solution. As said, at the end, the big animal different, uh, or anyway, not necessarily better than the standard car is the better. So safety and charging are the two issues. Thanks a lot, Vittorio. Uh, now I have a question to Umesh. Uh, this was the question from Bhushan. Uh, Umesh, I, I hope you are still there. Uh, so you have presented the Safa Tempo and the, the operation and maintenance issues in Nepal. So what are the main maintenance problems faced by Safa Tempo right now? Could you elaborate a bit? Uh, right now, uh, actually, at present, after having a you know new new type of a motor and a drive system technology, new drive system technology, we do have a very less maintenance cost. Initially, we used to have a DC motor and a DC type of a controller with a brass motor because it is a you know 25 years old technology where we used to use a lead acid battery and a DC motor with a brass. And we had a carbon brush problem wear and tear of a DC motor com competitors. This was a you know uh, very huge problem in the past. But now we have uh, already changed into uh, BM AC motor and uh, AC motors, and the drive system has been already changed. And we are using a lithium battery pack right now. So uh, right now, uh, in case of a uh, batteries and in case of a uh, uh, um, drive system maintenance also uh, very less problem we are facing. So our operation cost also has uh, you know gone down. Uh, even though our lithium batteries and uh, uh, the, this drive system initial cost is higher, but uh, in the long term uh, it is very much beneficial right now. And uh, uh, right now we are not. Uh, fishing that much uh, for a maintenance. There is much problem in a maintenance. Yeah. yeah, so your maintenance problem is lessened now with the new technologies. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Right. Great. Uh, I have one more question to you, Umesh, from Prachin. 
uh, can you able uh, elaborate uh, more fast charging stations, uh, like future of those fast charging station in Nepal? Uh, how policies uh, from government and private sector are uh, can enable it, in, uh, can in, enable e uh, easy charging to promote EVs in Nepal? Yeah, uh, basically, uh, if we see uh, overall aspect, uh, I always tell that uh, in a uh, there should be actually uh, right now it is just the opposite. Uh, the decision that has been made, uh, uh, the government is calling uh, who are interested to put a charging station uh, in the, near the highway or something like that, and the. What is the sustainability of those business? That is a very big question mark. You know, who uh, there should be? I think there should be uh, uh, like a, in a geographical condition of Nepal. Uh, in every 50 kilometer or every 70 kilometer, there should be one EV zone or EV charging station. That should be the concept. And uh, there there could be uh, um, another type of a charging station that if anybody wants to run by their own. But there should be some concept that uh, government should uh, uh, elaborately, you know, uh, facilitate to develop a charging station in uh, different locations of a highway and uh, intercity uh, ways. That is my concept of uh, EV zone. And EV zone does not mean only the charging station. It should facilitate uh, the maintenance and uh, backup of the, uh, you know, electric vehicle. So uh, that is basically the concept that uh, we need to go on. Yeah, so we can think of the future. Yeah. Uh, I would, for this, for this round, I would put one last question. So we can, we can again go back to Q&A at the end. So my, uh, my question is to Vittorio from Bhushan. So how are ISO and IEC standards different from GBT standards from China? as most of the vehicles coming from Nepal will be from China. Also in Europe, we have a common supplier, let me say. <laughs> I'm not joking. Um, um, in general, up to now, uh, Chinese uh, in some part were uh, not so forerunner as Europe, US, uh, Japan, Korea. And so they take advantage in, of the European uh, and China and Japanese standard that goes under the international ISO IEC brand or the American, the ACI uh, one. They in general are seen as applied one to one as a carbon copy where it was convenient, applicable, effective. In other case, they make modification changes in order to fit better their needs. Now, uh, you know, Chinese market is becoming a forerunner in the field. And so I see some cases in which they are changing approach. There is, for instance, an activity, a joint activity between Japanese and Chinese standardization organization to make a new standard for the CFAS charging at higher current, more than 500 amps. And this is something they do as foreigners. So as in any experience, they learn and then they take the role. But in general, the logic is try and dependently from the logo and the, and the element as much as possible the same approach when convenient and specified. For instance, the question of type one versus type two. In US, all distribution of electricity is in Japan is single phase. So they make a connector single phase. In Europe, there are also three phases and we meet the three phase. So what's the environment to push the differentiation in that case? Great, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for you three. Uh, so we will we'll move uh, move to the another presentation. I hope you will stay. Uh, if there are some questions from the participants, we will again. I mean, I said uh, move to the uh, Q and A at the end. So our next presenter. So let's move to the another part of the presentation on the vehicle retrofishing. Uh, so I, actually, Doc Mani has touched upon this part a bit in his pre previous presentation. Um, Karen, Karen will present on uh, retrofitting buses experience uh, from India. Uh, so he is from the Precision Concept Limited in India, uh, and will share. Uh, and and he is an executive director uh, uh, at PCO. 
Uh, he also jointly collaborated with industries in Europe, such as Motorin und Fahrzeugtechnik GmbH, uh, MFT in Germany, and Imos Mobile System in Netherlands. Uh, Karan, I, I hope you are there. Uh, could yes. you share your screen? Yeah, great. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Good. for joining. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sritu, for uh, having us uh, in this forum. Um, I, I would be, um, me and my colleague Pranav, who's also um, joined on this call, will go through a quick presentation on our company. Um, what we do um, through our company EMOS in Europe and what we've been doing in India uh, over the last one, one and a half year in terms of retrofitting. <clears throat> and uh, my colleague will also uh, go through some of the exact details of what it what it is uh, when we say retrofitting, what exactly do we do? So uh, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Can you see this? Yes, uh, maybe making a full screen would be better. Yeah, I have it on full screen now. Uh, yeah, now I can see. Okay, right. Um, so like you said, Shritu, um, just a quick background of our company. Uh, my name is Karan Shah. I'm executive director of the company. Uh, our company, the Precision Group, we're based in India, and we are predominantly uh, a, a component manufacturer, really, for the automotive industry. Uh, we're doing a variety of camshafts, uh, balancing shafts, injector parts, etc., uh, and we're supplying to essentially every OEM uh, around the world, right from North America, South America, Europe, uh, all of Asia. Uh, etc. So we've been in this business for the last 25, 30 years or so. Uh, and the reason, uh, don't want to go into too many details of that today, but one of the companies that we acquired three years ago is this company EMOS in the Netherlands, uh, which is a complete solution provider for electric drive lines for heavy equipment. Uh, and when I say heavy equipment, we work on vehicles, equipment, uh, or other uh, use cases for electrification from say five tons of gross weight all the way up to 50 tons. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of what exactly we do. Um, so like I said, uh, we produce uh, zero emission power systems and that's, uh, we work in very niche applications most of the times. Um, our company is based in Oosterhout, which is about <clears throat> 45 minutes west of Amsterdam. Um, and this company has been around for more than 10 years now. So it's not really a startup by any, uh, by any means. Um, we have about, this, this is a slightly older slide. We have now about 65 uh, full-time employees uh, at the company. Uh, and this company has a real uh, deep history in, in electrification of vehicles. And I'll show you some of that going forward. Uh, but at this point of time, we are servicing clients all around the world. Uh, our main focus obviously is Europe since we're based there. Uh, but the United States, uh, some parts of Australia and New Zealand are also where we supply our um, electric driveline kits, uh, which again, I'll show you some more examples. Uh, so the history of this company, like I said, has been around for a very long time. Um, the, the, our current CTO, uh, who is still very much with the company, was the original founder of the company, uh, who started with a development of a, a single reduction uh, gearbox for Tesla, uh, back in the day uh, and has since worked on electrification of a variety of different vehicles. You see right from passenger cars to small transit vehicles to the, you know, the 12 ton, 15 ton trucks. Uh, and then over the last few years, uh, even the higher tonnage uh, vehicles. <clears throat> in 2018, it, the company was fully acquired 100% by uh, the Precision Group, and we now lead the development of this company, not only in Europe, uh, but obviously trying to get this technology uh, to India, which is a very, uh, I would say, nascent market compared to Europe in terms of electrification. And I think the context of India and what we have been doing there uh, would be relevant, I think, uh, also to the Nepal context, so which is why uh, we thought we would present here today. So our key products, the two things that we do most of the time, uh, one is the retrofitting. And when I say that, um, typically a fleet owner uh, or a company that has a large fleet or small or large fleet of uh, commercial vehicles uh, would come to us and we would basically convert one of uh, uh, con convert these vehicles one at a time in our plant in, uh, in Oosterhout. Uh, Pranav will go into a little bit more detail on exactly what we do and how long it takes and things like that. But this is the typical retrofitting model. 
uh, we we have while we continue to do this and it, it, is a, it is a large part of our business we are now also focusing quite a bit on uh, the kit set model where we work with very specific niche oems across europe uh, these are the final um, uh, i would say the the equipment builders or the vehicle builders themselves the original equipment uh, manufacturers <clears throat> and they would typically uh, these oems would typically build uh, their specialty vehicles from scratch in their own plants, and then use a use an engine or a combustion engine from say a Fiat or a Daimler or whatever uh, to power their vehicles. Uh, what we do instead now is we provide them a complete driveline kit, which includes the battery pack, the motors, all the electronics, the wiring harnesses, right down to the nut and bolt uh, with a manual, uh, where the the customer can buy the kit set from us and install it. In their in their plants uh, on their vehicles, so that these vehicles are no longer retrofitted, but they're really uh, electric from day one. So these are the two key uh, two key products that we deal with. Um, and while doing so, we do not only pure battery electric, which is just powered on uh, the battery, but we also do some range extended versions where we have a small generator uh, IC or an, a small uh, sub one liter. IC engine, which is fitted onto the vehicle, uh, especially in heavy duty applications. And this, this engine is actually powering uh, or charging the batteries, not really driving uh, the, the, the wheels of the vehicle, but really charging the batteries. So yeah, when, when it comes to a new vehicle that we intend to do for a new customer, uh, we typically say that it takes one year from an idea uh, that we want to start electrifying a particular truck or a particular bus or a particular vehicle uh, to actually getting it running on the road, uh, fully homologated, going through all the regulatory process and making sure that it has uh, a roadworthiness certificate, if I may say. Uh, and it takes that one year to do the first one right. Uh, and we want to make sure that we have all the quality checks in place, uh, all the safety standards uh, applied there. And only then can we go into more of a serial kind of uh, production where then we can we, we can do multiple vehicles uh, you know we can do retrofitting of vehicles uh, in say a period of three to four weeks once we have done one correctly uh, and then uh, the kit set obviously is much faster because we are only building the sets in our in our plant and then shipping these out so uh, this is just a short uh, kind of uh, glimpse of what we've been doing. I already mentioned this. We do five tons to 50 tons. We do these ready to assemble kits. Um, and the, in summary, we have about 600 vehicles that we have electrified over the last, I would say, five years. Um, and we continue to do a significant amount every month now. So the number keeps adding. Uh, and so far, our vehicles or vehicles with our drive lines. Uh, have driven over 100 million miles, uh, especially in Europe. So we have a lot of that data uh, to kind of say, um, when we design a new driveline, when we have a new uh, use case application, how do we design for that use case? Uh, and we have this tremendous amount of data to kind of drive those decisions. Um, before we get into what exactly we do when it comes to retrofitting, just a few examples of typical customers that we have. Uh, this is a, a road sweeper company um, in Europe where they build the vehicle along with the road sweeper and everything. Uh, and we supply them kits uh, for completely elect electrifying their road sweeper, including all the mechanisms for cleaning. Uh, we have this company in New Zealand where uh, we, we only supply, this is a retrofitting case, so we supply them with kits, uh, but we have trained we have trained the local team so well uh, at waste management in new zealand that actually they are able to do the conversions now or they are able to do the retrofitting themselves uh, with us only supplying them uh, the initial kits um this is a very cool application that uh, we have been working on for the last <clears throat> say two years and it's actually going into a serious production now or serious numbers now uh, this is a company based in uh, northern, I think, Scandinavia, Sweden. Yeah, and uh, this it's a co completely autonomous truck. It's a it's a 50 ton truck, which is uh, fully autonomous and fully electric. Uh, so Einride does the elect uh, the autonomous technology and the building of the vehicle, etc. Uh, and we do the complete electrification of such a vehicle. And it's um, it has taken significant amount of time to come to a stage where a company like Emos can provide a, a real um, high class, high quality solution for a for a company like Einride, where they're able to 
apply these trucks between say warehouses or within ports or uh, even close distances in Sweden, uh, completely uh, electric and completely autonomous. <clears throat> this is an example of a typical uh, passenger bus that we do in the UK, uh, where we electrify uh, the bus. We, we, they're building the bus from ground up and we typically supply them the kit and they're assembling it into their uh, vehicle in their own plant. So this and uh, this is a, a re very recent project that we did of a retrofitting it's a i think it's a uh, 20 ton 20 ton vehicle which or a 14 ton vehicle uh, which we just retrofitted uh, for dhl in in the netherlands so uh, in short i think that was a summary of uh, what we do who are our typical customers and what kind of projects we do uh, and we have I, before I go into what, what we have been doing in India, um, I will let Pranav take over for a bit and um, go through some of the details on what exactly we do in terms of retrof retrofitting. So Pranav, I hand it to you. Hi, uh, this is Pranav. Uh, I am taking care of engineering and sales on the India for EMOS on the India side of things. So essentially, when we talk about retrofitment, uh, what really is retrofitment, right? Retrofitment for uh, high, uh, heavy commercial vehicles or commercial vehicles for general is very different than what the general idea is. So when we take a vehicle in for retrofitment, it we completely break down uh, the process in terms of uh, in four parts. One is the data collection, one is design finalization, then is integration, and then it is testing and roll off. So for vehicle data collection, we collect, all, so if we want to do retrofitting right, there's a lot of data that needs to be collected even before the parts are decided. And that's not what typically what a lot of the companies are doing in terms of, uh, uh, and I'm referring to companies getting kits from China and then just retrofitting them to vehicles and selling them. So what we essentially do is Take the take the baseline, uh, take the base vehicle in. We do all kinds of testing with the vehicle in terms of uh, baseline data collection. What kind of ho uh, horsepower? What kind of torque is actually able to generate? Uh, we collect all the CAD data so that we are able to design all the brackets, everything specifically for that vehicle. We collect the CAN uh, CAN matrix, uh, the control area network uh, data, uh, to so that we are able to replicate certain signals that are uh, that are on the base vehicle. After all of these data is collected, our team analyzes the data. And on the basis of that data, uh, we do the powertrain design finalization. We, we also, so what we as EMOS also offer is customization to some extent, right? So if a certain customer has a request in terms of gradability or there's some other request, we can also grandfather that in into the driveline. So, uh, so all of this data is collected along with certain requests from the customer, if at all, and then the powertrain design finalization process begins. Uh, then we go to sourcing and then uh, the integration phase starts. So in the integration phase, uh, it's not only mechanical integration, but we write our own software for the vehicle control unit. Uh, we write our own software for the battery management system and uh, the interaction between those two softwares is completely controlled by us. Uh, and uh, of course, the mechanical integration, all the parts that are sourced from vendors, they are put in, we write our software on top of it. Uh, and then comes the calibration and the testing phase. So uh, what we aspire to is that our vehicle should perform much better than what the base vehicle was, or at worst, it should perform equal. So that uh, uh, rigorous amount of testing is done uh, by us before roll off, and we take care of the homologation aspect of the vehicle as well. So what really changes uh, in a retrofitted vehicle, right? So uh, uh, what we change is, uh, the, of course, the motor changes, but along with that, there are a lot of auxiliary uh, auxiliary components that need to change in a, a heavy commercial vehicle. For example, the steering pump, the brake pump, all of these pumps uh, typically run on an engine, so, but since the engine is no longer there, these pumps that run or derive power from the engine uh, need, to be, uh, need to be switched out for electric pumps. So all of those need to be changed. Of course, the transmission. Since the mating of the transmission, the flange does not meet the original. We, uh, we have, for, uh, for all vehicles over 25 tons, we have our own uh, customary tra uh, 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 transmission from our uh, partners. And of course, the high voltage battery. 
there's another model of uh, retrofitment uh, that is uh, relatively new, but it's uh, gaining steam full speed. Uh, that is called remanufacturing. So essentially, uh, uh, especially in the Asian markets, you can really buy chassis from an OEM. So uh, if if in a particular vehicle segment, a customer wants uh, an el electric vehicle, but it's not really offered by an OEM, but he doesn't have his own vehicle. What we also provide is we buy the chassis from the OEM, uh, we add an electric driveline to it, and then we get the body built on top with our uh, bodybuilding partners, and then we deliver the uh, deliver the vehicle. And it can be it can have n number of auxiliaries, n number of customizations. For example, this this particular vehicle has a trash compactor auxiliary on top. So that level of customization across the board is really possible uh, with us. Really, why 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 should one retrofit? So there's there was this one really interesting paper. Uh, written by Mr. Chakraborty along with his partner last year, in fact. Uh, so he has uh, he has very elaborately shown us how the total cost of ownership per kilometer is uh, calculated for uh, an electric bus. And he has taken examples of an electric bus with equivalent uh, diesel engine, uh, uh, diesel buses, as well as CNG buses. And what really this study showed is at the current market price of electric vehicles as well as diesel vehicles, the total cost of ownership metrics only start making sense if the price of the base electric vehicle that is currently selling is reduced by 60%. Only then will the total cost of ownership start making sense. So yeah, so let's take an example uh, where this electric bus costs, uh, and this is in uh, Indian rupee terms, of course, uh, is uh, 1.75 crores. Uh, equivalent diesel engine bus costs about 56 lakh rupees. Uh, there's a drastic delta in terms of total cost of ownership per kilometer. But what Mr. Chakraborty says in his paper, the total cost of ownership at a 60% 60, uh, 60 reduction in the initial cost, uh, and that can be through subsidy, through n number of reasons, or through technology R&D. Once there's a 60% reduction in the initial purchase price of the electric bus, then the total cost of ownership per kilometer over a, over a span of, say, 75,000 kilometers will be equal to the diesel engine bus. And that's, that's really the inflection point. And what we offer with the retrofitted bus here is, is exactly that, a 60% reduction for you to be able to drive an electric bus. And I, I, I completely agree that uh, uh, there's, uh, there's a base vehicle that needs to be added, but these base vehicles typically when we work with customers for retrofitment are written off vehicles where they have reached really the end of their life cycle. And we just, uh, and they, so the option to the customer at that point is either to buy a new diesel engine vehicle or to get their current vehicle retrofitted. So at that point, our vehicle really starts making sense. Uh, so for these, uh, so for our foray into the Indian market, uh, what the Indian market really needed was a touch and feel product, uh, something that we needed to test in the Indian conditions because European conditions and Indian conditions have a huge delta. So what we did was actually retrofitted a, a diesel engine bus in India, and that is currently flying on Indian roads and it's uh, it's under testing and we are collecting all sorts of data with respect to temperatures, cell voltages, readability, et cetera, uh, top speed, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, we find uh, the, uh, a drastic operating cost uh, reduction uh, in uh, this diesel engine bus. Uh, this is this bus we are able to run at about three uh, three point five rupees or three point six rupees per kilometer, which is drastically less as compared to what it was before. Uh, so I think Mr. Shah will talk about our localization efforts in, uh, in India and what we've been able to achieve. And uh, he will also talk a, a little bit more about what we intend to do in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Kanav. So I'll go back one slide also. I think I just want to touch base a little bit more on what we've been doing in India. Um, so obviously for us, um, we have some bus applications that we have done in Europe, and it would be fairly simple to just pull a bus over from there, bring it to India and try to say that, you know, this is a vehicle that can be sold here uh, but two of the biggest factors um, which would not allow that was basically to make sure that in the future can we actually do the retrofitting ourselves in India 
Number two, can we find good quality suppliers in India who can support uh, and who can support the retrofitting and supply uh, the supply chain? Uh, and the third, actually, is also the commercial front because without uh, really a lot of localization being done in India and a, a lot of the cost drivers being um, reduced, uh, it would be almost impossible to have a, a viable, a commercially viable solution for the Indian market. So. Uh, we have a team of about seven or eight people now in India who, uh, of course, uh, we depend and we rely on our Euro European team for the research and development and for the engineering expertise. Uh, but the actual physical uh, um, supply chain development as well as integration onto this force traveler vehicle has all been done in India over the last one year. Uh, and we've got uh, just in this very first vehicle, 52% uh, of parts have already been uh, localized in India, which is actually 60% uh, in terms of value of the bill of material, if you may say. So in the very first vehicle, we were able to find very good suppliers in India uh, who could provide us with uh, the, whether the electronic components, the battery packs uh, and, other, and other very critical uh, parts. Um, obviously going forward, we would, uh, we intend to have more than 80% localization uh, when we're, we're dealing with uh, uh, increased volumes. I think on the charging front, I heard a little bit of the previous conversation, but we do have uh, good charging partners um, in India as well. Uh, there's a company EO Chargers who we uh, partner with for uh, AC charging. And then we have uh, Tata Autocom that does uh, DC charging solutions for us. And we are happy to kind of provide this as a packaged product with, um, with, with the vehicle or with the retrofitting services that we do. So um, what is it that we are planning to uh, do in the future? I think we do have a lot of e-bus um, and e-truck projects that um, uh, we, are, we, we are working with and uh, dealing with a lot of the state transport um, authorities as well as corporate clients to do conversions of their existing uh, e-buses uh, or trucks. Uh, one of the biggest markets that we see in India for electrification is actually the uh, light commercial vehicles uh, and purposely blurred out here in this image because uh, we are still uh, in the process of developing a, a, a really, um, you know, 100% uh, electric LCV for this Indian market. <clears throat> and we, we are already in touch with, you know, a lot of the large players uh, who use hundred thousand, uh, hundreds and thousands of these uh, vehicles for last mile mobility. Uh, and the plan, of course, in the future would be decarbonization in India, uh, without which uh, a lot of this, which is planned, uh, would not be possible. So I think um, with that, uh, I will stop uh, my presentation. And if there are any specific questions, uh, happy to share or ha happy to answer either me or Pranav. Um, uh, thanks a lot. Um, of course, uh, in Asia or uh, like uh, everywhere, retrofitting e-bus has a potential to de decarbonize public transport, as well as, of course, the resource efficiency aspect. Uh, you have also mentioned the related economic and technical issues and steps which needs to be considered during the retrofitting vehicles. Um, I would like to ask um, the, the participants to pose question. Uh, Karan, would you would you be staying for a while so we can have another presentation and put, uh, put your questions afterwards? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. I would cool. be there for some time. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have a last but not the, not the least presentation uh, from Abhishek Karki. Um, Abhishek is giving a brief insight on retrofitting vehicles in Nepal. So he's a founder director of Abhiyantri Karmashala Limited. Uh, which is a leading young organization working in consulting EV design and policy advocacy in Nepal, of course. Uh, he's also a regional consultant for Solutions Plus project under UMI. Hello, Namaste. This is Abhishek Karki from Kathmandu, Nepal. And I would like to welcome you all for this training program and also my presentation on retrofitting uh, vehicles in the context of Nepal. And th these are the context of my presentation. And going to the introduction of the retrofitting vehicles. Uh, as Imos has already presented on retrofitting and, and basically retrofitting is like uh, replacement of the combustion engine from the vehicle that goes under the uh, conversion process and with the electronic uh, battery components like the motor batteries and powertrain components. And in this picture, we can see that like how, how, how are the 
vehicles being uh, converted in Nepal with the replacement of the uh, rear, uh, rear axle with the uh, electric components. Uh, moving to, uh, to the histori historical background of Nepal, uh, uh, electric vehicle uh, conversion it is not a new thing in Nepal and it started way back in 1993 with the uh, uh, diesel power become tempo, uh, which was converted into Safa tempo. Uh, in 1993, seven uh, diesel power uh, three wheel public vehicle, also not, known as become tempo, was converted into electric. Uh, uh, electric parts of a tempo under the aid of the USA. Uh, after the successful conversion of uh, these five uh, or seven uh, digital power vehicle tempo into of a tempo, mm, uh, five different companies uh, started manufacturing uh, uh, Safa tempo. Around 600 Safa tempos were successfully manufactured and they have been successfully running till date today. In 1994, uh, Volkswagen. Uh, Beetle car from a Volkswagen was converted into EV by the EV development groups by the name of uh, Vikas Pandey, Kiran Joshi, Sanjeev Pondare, and Giris uh, Pokhel. It was the first conventional vehicle, private vehicle that was electrified in Nepal and it proved the possible potential of electric electrification in Nepal. But due to the lack of government policies, uh, such converted vehicle couldn't run on the roads of Nepal. and even though the interest, uh, due to with the interested customer uh, who were willing to convert their vehicle, they couldn't uh, move on to the conversion of the vehicle. And in 2004, Sikh Vigilary converted the gasoline power only van into the electric uh, vehicle. We also faced the similar kind of challenge in Nepal uh, on uh, due to the policy and the standard, the vehicles could no more run on the uh, streets of the Nepal. And the, these are the companies who are currently retrofitting the vehicles in Nepal. Uh, Sikh Visionary, uh, it, uh, it has maintained its legacy of retrofitting the vehicles in Nepal until date today. And the new company, Digo and Orient uh, Council, uh, they are into this business right now. Uh, so if we go to the reason why we need to go to the electrification, firstly, uh, we don't have the trash zone where in Nepal, where we'll go for scrapping the old vehicles. And second, uh, of course, this environment matter. Uh, um, we, we don't want vehicle emission and we breathe the air, um, polluted air. And uh, thirdly, uh, better energy efficiency. We all know that uh, electric vehicles uh, in electric motor, they are highly efficient in con uh, transforming the energy uh, that are stored in the form of the battery into the wheel. Uh, it converts almost 77% uh, of the energy in the grid, uh, from the grid to the uh, wheel while uh, oh. comparing to the IC power vehicle, they convert only from 13% to the 30%. Uh, and it uh, creates an economic growth where uh, there will be a lot of job placement and, and the lower cost of the maintenance and the cost uh, of the buying the fuels for the vehicles. And we go through the technical aspect of the vehicle conversion in Nepal. Uh, there are the three stages, three phases, uh, which we have been going through the pre conversion, conversion, and the post conversion. In the pre conversion, uh, we plan for like removal of the uh, IC power components and its accessories and that uh, won't be required after the uh, conversion. And we go for arrangement of the working space where in the lab or the workshop where the vehicle will be converted. And the arrangement of the tools, which will be, which will be used for the vehicle conversion process. And during the conversion process, there will be a process like uh, uh, removing the engines and mounting of the electronic components and wire harness. Post conversion, uh, it will go through the homologation process and the final finishing of the pro project. And and taking the uh, summarizing the previous steps, uh, we go through the. Uh, vehicle is scanning through the train scanning device where, uh, through which we can determine whether, whether the vehicle will be fit enough to go through the conversion or not. And secondly, we go for different simulations to, to size the different power train components in like the motor and the batteries uh, as, per the, as per the requirements for the vehicle to be converted. And move, moving to the next step, uh, during the conversion, uh, the engine and this uh, uh, related relevant studies will be removed from the vehicles, and secondly, the, the electronic uh, vehicle component like motor, controls, and the 
uh, battery bags will be uh, retrofitted into that vehicle. And finally, the vehicle will go through different kind of the engineering testing process for, uh, to pass the homologation process. And the challenge of the retrofitting in Nepal is, of course, the standards uh, and the government policy and the time frame. Uh, time frame because uh, like uh, there, there isn't any you know, local company we sell the, the retrofitting components in Nepal. So it has to be imported from the different country from India, China, which will take some uh, read time from three months to six months. Uh, it will uh, definitely, it's a long time uh, to convert a single vehicle. And definitely in the future, uh, there will be more uh, new company that will, uh, who will be the, who will be providing the uh, retrofitting components in Nepal. In that case, uh, the uh, lead time for the project can be minimized. And finally, the company, before conclusion, what I would like to say that uh, these are the vehicles uh, that has been registered in the Nepal, which are um, two, two, oh, two, up to 20 years old in Nepal. And if we consider only, the, uh, assuming that if only 20% of these vehicles are uh, fitted for the uh, retrofitting, then we still have 7,772 units of buses, uh, uh, fitting 131 units of uh, micro vehicles, and 38,170 cars, Jeep, and taxis. Uh, we saw the huge potential for the retrofitting uh, vehicle in Nepal. And these are the resources that have been used for preparing this uh, uh, presentation. And, and Final, I would like to say thank you. If there's any queries, I'm more than happy to share my knowledge with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abhishek, uh, to give an insight what's happening in Nepal. Um, so you also, also mentioned like what are the, there are like very few companies doing retrofitting uh, or activities in Nepal. Uh, of yeah. course, there are the challenges that you mentioned, uh, standards, policy, and time frame and so forth. Uh, but how do you see how could we enhance this retrofitting activities? Uh, is that like um, how do you see how how we can how we can enhance uh, retrofitting in Nepal? Uh, despite uh, there are the um, policy lagging and uh, standards, uh, but it's still. Uh, we are we are advocating for the policy in Nepal that we are pressuring the government, and um, we, we need to continue this uh, legacy of retrofitting so that we can pressurize the government that is still feasible for uh, retrofitting in Nepal as well. Uh, it's a cost effective, uh, a cost benefit as the EMOS has already presented a uh, total cost ownership that was uh, uh, practiced in India and in India and Nepal. The, 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 the tissue is uh, quite similar, and we can present this kind of data to the government and pressure the government uh, to to make the environment friendly policy for uh, retrofitting the vehicles in Nepal. And maybe in the future, we, we are hoping that uh, in the past budget, uh, the government has already mentioned for uh, retrofitting the vehicles by next 10 years, uh, the, uh, retrofitting the old vehicles. And maybe uh, those uh, policy will be implemented very soon in Nepal. Uh, so the the latest question that Bhushan faced it: uh, how how are the standards for retrofitting in Nepal? Uh, sorry, sorry, in India. Uh, do you think they are adequate? Um, I think at, at this point of time there is not very clear policy from um, the government on retrofitting. I think most of the um, policy or the subsidies uh, and regulation is all uh, driven towards um, new 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 buses or new electric buses or trucks. Uh, so there there needs to be a more defined um, you know standard and policy for sure. I, I think it's it is not adequate at this point of time. Do 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 industries like yours get some incentives or there are none from the national or local government? No, not at this point. So there is a. Uh, there is a, a large program in India called FAME, F-A-M-E, mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, they're trying to faster adoption of electric vehicles, uh, but this is all driven towards uh, new uh, vehicles and for, for OEMs. So, for example, the government would provide 
provide um, a certain amount of subsidy directly to the end consumer for buying uh, an electric vehicle, whether it's a passenger car or whether it's a bus or a truck. Uh, but there is no uh, clear policy or standard for retrofitting at this point of time. So most of these costs are uh, borne by the end customer. Yeah, so yeah, we definitely need some policies to uh, to retrofit vehicles uh, beside giving incentives for buying a new new electric vehicle, of course. So I, I mean, I think you have touched upon this a little bit, but can you just a little bit explain how to determine when the vehicle needs to be or can be retrofitted? I mean, of course, the age of the vehicle is always there, uh, but some other consideration. So, okay, this vehicle of although if it's like 20 years or 15 years uh what is the basic uh like determina yeah. determining uh, con uh, consideration for retrofitting i mean uh, when we actually talk about heavier commercial vehicles buses and trucks we are not really looking for vehicles which are say 15 20 years old because a lot of the um the, the base of these vehicles is not um how would you say is not sufficient or is not adequate for uh, retrofitting or conversion into electric and then still running safely. So one of the first things that we would do is um, have, say, a 100-point checklist to go through a vehicle when we first get it into our hands to say, is this structurally sound? Is the is the chassis having a good integrity? Uh, are all is From a safety point of view, uh, are, are, the, are things all the way they should be? Uh, or if it's a, even a five, six, seven year old vehicle, uh, you're going to have uh, some some challenges with say the suspension or the brakes or other things like that. So we would first of all, make sure that these are corrected uh, and these are fixed and brought up to the best standards. And then we actually go into the retrofitting of the powertrain or the driveline itself. So I think the structural integrity of the chassis is also very important. Um, one of the things that we found uh, while we were doing a few of these uh, Indian projects is that when we're looking for much older vehicles, uh, the way the, elect the the way the software has been written, say ten years ago on these vehicles, uh, the way that you know the communication happens between the different components, or let's say the speedometer uh, and the, uh, the, the 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 main control unit of the vehicle, it's it's very it's quite old. Uh, and it's uh, many a times not compatible with some of the components or some of the electronics that we are uh, choosing to use. So we have to be, you know, we have to be aware of certain uh, things before we go too far back. Uh, so I think these are some of the some of the um, uh, things that we look at initially. Thanks, thanks, Karan. Um, maybe I'll put the last question. Uh, I think uh, Doc Mani is also there. Uh, so. So how 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 is retrofitting a bus or or mini bus different from a car or light duty vehicle, uh, from the experience in India, from the experience in Philippines? So is uh, retrofitting a small vehicle easier or difficult, like a, a bigger vehicle difficult? Uh, either if you would like to share your thoughts on that. Uh, maybe I can. I can only talk about the commercial vehicles because that's what we work in. But I think we have, um, I think in a in a typical truck, uh, we have the good advantage of space sometimes because we have a lot of space to have enough of these battery packs and all of these things, uh, all the components to fit there. Uh, but then there are also the challenges on um, because they're heavier vehicles, how much range can we get out of them? Uh, is the battery pack uh, there, there's a certain level where you can keep adding batteries to a vehicle before it starts getting so heavy that it's actually eating into the range itself or it's eating into the payload of the vehicle. So we have to have a very careful balance there. I think that the way we design motors or transmissions or the electric motors, I mean, for trucks is very different from uh, how we would do it for cars. So I think we are in a slightly different uh, uh, area altogether. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Karan. Uh, Dr. Mani, would you like also like to respond on this? How retrofitting differs uh, based on the uh, the vehicle type? Or oh, maybe Abhishek, uh, would you like also like to respond to this? Sorry, I, sorry, I missed the question. Which which one? Ah, so the the question from Bhushan was uh, uh, so how the retrofitting of uh, like bus or minibus of different 
uh, forms of car or light duty vehicle. So how is retrofitting, uh, is, is retrofitting easier for the smaller vehicle or it is a bit complicated for, of course, uh, for the bigger ones? Uh, we, How we is have retrofitting a first? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we can uh, have a look from the different uh, aspect of the technologies. At first, for the smaller and the light duty vehicle, the component size will be smaller and the, the weight will be much uh, smaller than compared to that of the, the heavy vehicles. And, and the design of this uh, placement of those components will be easier for light duty vehicle than the heavier vehicle, and and also the and also the like uh, 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 testing of the vehicles before uh, before the conversion, and uh, because like scanning the smaller vehicle, uh, small vehicle are much easier than that of heavy heavy duty vehicles, uh, and also okay. also also the, also to balance to balance the CG of the vehicle. These smaller vehicles are much easier than heavy vehicles. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I would just like to open the floor to the to the participants. So if you want to pose a questions uh, or you want to speak, uh, 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 then you can also speak. Uh, is there someone who wants to uh, pose a question? There was one, 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 one comment from Bhushan uh, to Karan. Uh, so I hear Kerala government has some policies or incentive to promote retrofit. Is that so or how are these policies? Is just for the Kerala or it has not been uh, for other states? No, I, I, to be honest, I am not really aware of such a policy. I um, need to look at this. I have not heard of it, at least in this part of the country. Uh, so if there is no more question, I see no questions from the chat. So uh, I would like to thank you all uh, for your wonderful and informative presentation. Uh, of course, for Nepal, in which uh, EV technical standards is yet to be developed, uh, the today's presentation and diffusion under this uh, discussion, under this uh, training, uh, will be highly useful and will be a step stepping stone for the formulation of EV guideline uh, in, in Nepal. So after hearing a lot of discussion, uh, what do you think? Is vehicle retrofitting a viable option in Nepal? So please uh, share your opinion. But as we have seen, most of people are quite encouraged about the vehicle retrofitting and sees like this is a viable option uh, to be taken uh, further. Uh, in, in Nepal. Uh, thanks, thanks for your uh, input. Just to brief you what's happening. So tomorrow uh, we will be discussing on, on the EV charging system for Nepal. Uh, so as you, as you know, this is a four, four day event. So tomorrow would be the last online event for this training. So please join at the same time. Uh, if, you, if, if your colleagues or haven't registered, please ask them to register. So it will be very interesting part on planning EV, EV system, uh, EV, EV charging system. Uh, on Friday, as I mentioned, uh, it will be on-site. So there will be an on-site visit at local industry named Vigo, where you will get insight on EV technology and charging system. For those who are in Kathmandu, please confirm your participation via the link in the chat box. With this, on behalf of uh, Solutions Plus uh, project uh, uh, and Asia team uh, from, from Pena Asia and Wuppertal Institute, I would like to uh, thank you again for all th thank you again to all the speakers for your contribution as well as participants for joining this training. Uh, so see you tomorrow and thank you and namaste.